large contingent from the public um, who are auditing this meeting. And I would just like to say that um, I've been informed that this meeting will be eventually posted onto the City of White Rock um, website. So if anyone has problems with their name, <coughs> excuse me, or image uh, being available um, in a broader sense, then I would ask uh, if that's beyond your comfort level to excuse yourself from the meeting. Uh, if you do not have a problem with your name or potentially your image um, being shown uh, in relation to this meeting on the City of White Rock website, uh, you're welcome to stay. I should also say um, that, again, it's not very often that we get um, such a great public turnout, but I would like to remind all that the purpose uh, the, the purpose of the advisory design panel is essentially to provide peer review to proponents who are presenting um, major projects to the city of White Rock. As such, um, typically the panel members, staff and the proponents are the only ones to speak. There are avenues um, if you want to provide additional public input, if you have concerns, issues or, or praise for a project such as this, um, you can either go to the public information meetings, there's public hearings in many cases, or um, you can approach the a planner who is working on the project or manager of planning. Um, so with uh, that housekeeping um, out of the way, I'd like to move to the second um, the second uh, item on the agenda, which is the adoption of the agenda. Um, can I have a motion from the panel to adopt the agenda as circulate? So move. Okay. I and second. Second it, and yeah. without any objections or discussion, um, then the, the motion is passed, the adoption of the agenda is such. Uh, the third item is the adoption of the minutes or the approval of the minutes as circulated from our April 20th, 2021 meeting. Short meeting, um, I'm ho hopeful that the panel has had a chance to um, review those minutes. Do I have a motion? from the panel to adopt the minutes as circulated. Sure, I will I will propose to adopt uh, the minutes. Okay, thank you. Sure, thank you. Second. All right, Second. and without uh, any objections or further discussion, the minutes from the April 2021 meeting have been adopted. Uh, so the first item, up, our first and only item tonight is um, a, a repeat performance. I'm excited to see how that unfolds. Um, so what I'll do right now is um, pass it over to Greg Newman uh, to give a staff perspective on the application that we're going to review tonight. Greg? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, um, just bear with me while I switch screens. Can people nod their head or just let me know that you're able to see yeah. that okay? Okay. We see that. Okay, so thanks, Mr. Chair, through you. And as you mentioned, this is a revised submission to the panel. The original application was heard on October 20th of last year. Um, the subject properties are highlighted here in the, the um, orthographic map. You can see it's 1465, 1443 to 45, and 1441 Vidal, as well as 14937 Thrift Avenue. So four properties being assembled to support the project. Uh, the applications that are um, have been made to the city include a zoning bylaw amendment as well as a major development permit uh, that were received in 2019. The original proposal, uh, as I mentioned, that was presented to the ADP on October 20th of last year, presented 129 units with uh, composition as presented here. So um, one of the things I, I will point out to in a point to in a minute is that the city's official community plan. Uh, encourages what we consider family friendly housing. So two and three bedroom units being at least 30% of the composition of development. So the proponents were uh, satisfying this policy incentive um, in the original submission. It uh, was presented as a six story building over a three story parkade, uh, 180 parking stalls uh, being 141 tenant and 39 visitor. And at the time of the original submission, um, there was a deficient parking supply from what the zoning bylaw uh, general provisions would have required. And that was something that would be incorporated into the property specific uh, zoning. So a comprehensive development or CD zone. So the advisory design panel provided comments. This is just a very quick snapshot. Any member of the public that's attending that would like to see the minutes, I can certainly send those to you. 
um, for more detail, but some of the key pieces that were coming out of that ADP meeting were uh, there, there was a desire of the panel to see greater regard for the context of the property, more information regarding potential impacts to trees. There are some very large mature trees on the north portion of the property as well as the lands to the west. Um, the structural composition and makeup of the building was unclear. Uh, landscaping um, plans were lacking detail, Roof, rooftop programming and hardscapes. We wanted to see some more information regarding those pieces. And then there was some concern expressed regarding the horizontal scale of the building, the navigability uh, of the building from, say, the interior parkade. And then also just general interest expressed about the uh, supply of electric vehicle charging uh, within the building. And that's a snapshot. There were other uh, details provided by the panel, but we do have some new members of the panel for just so for your awareness as well at some of the things that were discussed. So the updated submission, and I, I do want to defer most of the changes to the architect team to be able to, to walk you through, but just at a quick high level uh, revisions to scale and density. So they've lowered the total number of units from 129 to 103. You can see the composition has changed as well. So there are um, fewer, uh, they've done some consolidation of units and so uh, as well as what are referred to as three bedroom adaptable units. So maybe defer to the architect to explain what that looks like. Um, they've uh, lowered a, a large portion of the building as well. So they've stepped the building down uh, slightly. And again, I'll defer to the architect to, to provide those details, but they've um, removed access to this large portion of the of the upper north north part of the building. And that in and of itself has resulted in the way that the building would be classified as changing. Um, so as I mentioned, reduction uh, shared rooftop amenity. It's actually, although it looks as though um, it is an actual reduction in the supply of parking, they're now meeting, the project is now meeting the parking supply requirement of the bylaw because of um, uh, the fact that they haven't reduced the parking as much as they've reduced the units. And then now the, the proponent is um, committing to ensuring that all parking stalls are roughed in for uh, electric vehicle stage two charging. Uh, 19 stalls themselves would be provided the, the charge. Um, as it relates to the policy framework, so the lands in the official community plan are within the town center transition area where there's support for multi-unit residential uses with a max density of 1.5. So that means you could build out floor area being 1.5 times the total area of the lot and height of uh, range of six to 12 stories in accordance with figures nine and 10 in the, in the OCP. There's also a policy in the plan today that speaks to additional floor area. So floor area ratio can be increased by 40% where at least 50% of that additional floor area is made up of rental units. So it's a rental housing policy incentive. And, and as I mentioned that there, the area is recognized for its mature trees. There are some very large trees to the west and north. And this is one of the defining characteristics of the overall neighborhood. Uh, sorry. I'm just going to mute a couple people that are joining us. Um, the OCP speaks to the importance of uh, supporting transition uh, and integrating design with existing development. And again, I'm, I'm sort of highlighting that as a point of focus of the committee at the last meeting, the panel, uh, looking to reinforce and enhance the character of the existing streetscape, limit impacts uh, to views by having uh, limited floor plate size and setbacks. And, and also varying height uh, moving from North Bluff Road where you'd have taller buildings south towards Thrift Avenue where this property uh, abuts. The property is also within a multifamily development permit area. Um, before we get into some of the applicable development permit area guidelines, I did want to just give the panel an, an acknowledgement. I know uh, members of the public are well aware of the ongoing review of the official community plans. So, um, on March 29th, city staff present, presented to the Land Use and Planning Committee the results of an ongoing um, public survey about building heights outside of the town centre. And there was a motion passed uh, by the committee that was in this area, the town centre transition area, looking at maximum heights of four storeys with the potential to go up to six storeys with an affordable housing component. So. Um, I, I just sort of point to this for awareness that the application is right now in the stage of design review and if there are, um, depending on how the, the official community plan policy amendments take shape and the timing of those, 
there may need, need to be adjustments to the the project to make sure that they're consistent with, with the uh, applicable policies of the plan. So as it relates to uh, multifamily development permit area guidelines, um, some of the key ones are to ensure compatibility in terms of height, density, design, prescribe some setbacks for plantings and tower setbacks as well. There's support for barrier-free access. Uh, I will mention that, again, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna mute some more people. Um, the applicant will probably speak to this as well, but one of the things that has changed midstream with this file has been that the city has introduced new accessible parking standards. Uh, as a general provision within the zoning bylaw, and so that's something that the applicant has responded to, and and they've ensured that they would be meeting the current accessible parking supply requirements and dimensioning requirements of the bylaw, the zoning bylaw. Uh, there are um, guidelines that support the articulation and breakup of massing so that the horizontal span of buildings, say in this case, do not read as such a large and long span. Uh, encouragement for shared rooftop decks for residents. Uh, private amenity is especially important, especially in as we're coming to learn with with COVID and this pandemic and the need for opportunity to escape the home. Um, so that's something that the, the guidelines support uh, West Coast design and lastly, um, looking at loading loading spaces and that sort of functionality to be situated within the building. My last slide is the public information meeting for the project, which was intended to raise awareness. The original submission was held in August of last year. We then went to the advisory design panel in October, and we're here again today uh, to, to receive the revised submission. Um, but moving beyond today, if the design is supported to proceed, staff would be working with the applicant to prepare a draft zoning amendment bylaw to present to the Landis and Planning Committee for potential first and second reading, and then we would take the project to a public hearing, so statutory public hearing, so that members of the public could have more direct involvement in speaking and expressing their interest to council. Um, following that, there may be opportunity then to look at the third reading, final reading of the zoning bylaw, and the applicant could proceed to building. So with that, Mr. Chair, I would um, turn it over uh, through yourself to the applicant's uh, architecture team. I believe we have representatives from Keystone here uh, Van der Zam, uh, which is the landscape architecture firm, and I don't believe we have um, represents some Vinian Associates, but that may not be the case. Okay, thank you, Vic. Can, I, uh, can you hear me? I'm not sure if I'm muted or not. Uh, yes, we can hear you. Joe, can you hear me? Yeah. Can we take, uh, could there be an opportunity to ask uh, Greg uh, questions before we go to the applicant? Um, Sure. Is it is it a procedural question, Phil, or no, is it? No, it's a question about what he just presented. Okay. I think it's better sure. to just make sure it's clear. Uh, sure. If if Greg could go back, uh, <clears throat> I'm not clear because one of the things we're supposed to talk about under our, our terms mm -hmm. is about uh, comments on variances. I made the word or so. If there's a bylaw change, so could you go back to something that you commented? Uh, uh, are there any? Variances, maybe that's not the right word to use, but with respect to the OCP, the existing OCP, or the existing zoning, what, if any, are the change, are the variances or differences between what's being proposed now and those rules? Yes, so through you, Mr. Chair, the original submission, in my opinion, was aligned with the policies of the official community plan. So there was no no sort of necessity for an official community plan amendment. So that wasn't part of their submission. The um, the application is for a rezoning to create a property specific comprehensive development zone. Where I may have mentioned that there were some deviations from the general provisions of the bylaw, whereas they relate to parking. So originally there um, the the city's uh, zoning bylaw requires 1.2 spaces of parking per unit for multifamily residential development and then 0.3 spaces per unit for visitor parking. And the applicant originally was not meeting that requirement. Um, with the original submission, they were making an argument that the demand for parking would be less in this development than would otherwise be stipulated in the bylaw and therefore they were seeking a reduction through the rezoning process. And um, uh, 
with the reduction in the unit supply that's now being proposed, they no longer need the deviation from the general parking standard of the bylaw. So that that relief has now been sort of diminished. So, so to follow up on, on uh, so setbacks are the same, but it, it clarify for me what the current is the current zoning for single family homes or or townhouses or what is the current zoning in that or for those lots? Uh, yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. So the current zoning is what's the two properties on the south, the immediate south. So the one fronting on the thrift and the one immediately north of it are here just for the benefit of. The reason I'm asking is you said that there's going to be a zoning amendment. So I'm trying to understand what that zoning amendment is relative uh, to this, this uh, development. This report. Happy to clarify. I'm happy okay. to clarify that through the chair. It's, um, so the two properties on the south here, hopefully you can see that are their zone RS1, which is a one unit residential zone. The property north of that has our, our duplex zone. So it's an RT1 zone. And then the lands on the far, far north are actually within a comprehensive development CD32 zone, which I believe allows for a multi-unit development. I see Carl Isaac, Mr. Isaac, the director of planning and development services has his hand up. Carl, I don't know if you want to add some detail. Uh, sure, I, I just have the zone map in front of me as well. So if you allow me to share the screen. Um, the I, Can others see it now on, the, on their screens? Yes. Yep. Um, so you can see the, the tan or gold color is that comprehensive development zone, which hasn't proceeded. And then there's the mix of the duplex and single family zones there. So it, it's an assembly of sites that um, had different zoning applied to it before uh, this project was proposed. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Greg. Um, so hopefully, Phil, that's addressed your questions. Yes, it does. Um, and so, Greg, I can turn it back to you again to the reintroduction of the project team, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So with that, uh, Lucas, I see, um, see the project architects here. If you want to share your screen, Lucas, we can have you introduce who you have as part of the proponent team to present, and then I'll turn it over to you. That's great. We can see that, Lucas. Thanks. Excellent. <clears throat> Thanks, Greg. Uh, yeah, so we have uh, Lucas Lipkis here, the project manager from Keystone Architecture. Um, been designing or working on this project uh, since the onset. Eric Cox Leitner is here with me. He's the architect of record. Um, he's going to jump in on the presentation when we get into more of the exterior design uh, massing of the building. I think we're going to start off. Um, also, we have uh, Derek Jerk from. Uh, from Banner Zam and Associates, or the landscape consultant, who's going to be stepping in on some of the landscape slides. We'll speak to those. And uh, Peter Fatbender, who's the owner's representative, is going to start us off here with a, a, a few words and then uh, wrap up the presentation at the end as well. So, Peter, if you're there, you can uh, go ahead and jump in. I am, and uh, thank you. I'm here at Weststone along with uh, Krista Cree while I'm on her computer. That's why my name didn't come up. Uh, but uh, Mr. Chair and Greg, thank you very much. And I want to thank the ADP panel for the opportunity to come and present to you. Uh, I've been working with Weststone on this project in terms of some of the dynamics. And as the panel knows, there's been significant debate in the city of White Rock as it relates to developments. And this, uh, as was indicated, back in October of 2020 was brought forward as a much different project. It was really important for Weststone to take all of the comments that they received, not only from the panel, but also in dialogue with staff and with some of the debate that was going on at the council table about the future of development in White Rock. And so a number of uh, modifications have been made to the proposal that uh, the architects are going to go through uh, some issues around the landscaping and the quality, the environmental protection of mature trees and all of those issues. One of the things I did want to point out to um, the ADP panel and ultimately to council and the community is the fact that Westone is a developer that is committed to the communities that they operate in. And some of you may know, um, I used to be a mayor of a Metro Vancouver community, 
and West Stone built a number of projects in my community when I was the mayor. And I knew that they were very committed to building quality product and not to be a developer that comes into a community, builds a project and then leaves, but stays in the community in a very active way. And West Stone, of course, is doing that. The staff has worked hard at West Stone along with the City of White Rock staff and Greg and his team to really refine the project to a project that uh, is going to be something that we believe very strongly White Rock uh, will be proud of in the future and that meets some of the growth needs that uh, you as a community have looked at. When we go through the presentation, the architects are going to outline uh, two really important things to you. One is a five-story building with associated parkade, uh, and the other is a four-story. The five-story is proposed to be rental, and as you know, rental is one of the issues in Metro Vancouver that is important, but uh, also recognizing the desire of council and some of the debate around potential OCP amendments. The second thing you're going to see toward the end is a four-story version that also reflects a lot of the other comments as it relates to design and character and all of those issues. Um, now that uh, the design has been changed, there is no requirement for parking variances. And uh, that again was an issue that was of concern. The developer is also very cognizant of the issues that the public has had about uh, traffic in the area and also really recognizing the uh, comfort of the other buildings surrounding this proposed development, both the ones to the north and the ones to the east. And so again, trying to protect everything that can be done for those residents, for their comfort and enjoyment of their homes, whether it is in the multi-story building uh, to the east or the townhouses to the north. I, I really want to say again that uh, toward the end I'll do the wrap up, but I know that uh, Eric and Lucas and David have worked very hard on the design elements. And of course, uh, the panel is going to want to dive into those. With that said, I'm going to turn it back to Lucas and then I will look forward to joining you at the end of their presentation. Thank you. Uh, but before you start, if I may, um, as chair speaking, um, Greg, can you, can you please provide a little bit of clarity here in terms of um, how we are really to proceed? Because typically when I've been involved in advisory design panel in the past, um, we're considering the project that's been put in front of us. Um, <clears throat> with the added complexity of, of different schemes, uh, would you provide some comment to that, please? Yeah, since you're here, Mr. Chair, I, I believe the intention is to present the revised proposal as it relates to addressing the comments of the ADP from the October 20th meeting, uh, but to, in a very limited way, acknowledge an alternative that may uh, need to be pursued, pursued coming out of potential changes to the OCP framework. And I would expect that that is intended to be uh, very high level and uh, not not being presented as something that uh, the applicants are seeking feedback from the panel on, but more as an alternate that may need to be pursued depending on what comes out of the OCP review. Okay, so, thank you. Uh, yeah, Joe, I'm uh, sorry, can you hear me again? Yes. Yeah, I, I, was, I wasn't going to in interfere uh, or, or comment, but it, I had the same question. I've spent a lot of time going through the material based on, on the presentation. And, and so, it, just in terms of where we are, I mean, I, I'm certainly, we thank God we have uh, the full uh, meeting just for this, so I have the time for it. But w when we're listening to it, can you give me a sense of what our possible responses might be? Because that would be useful, because based on what I'm hearing, it would be that this would, something would be coming back to the ADP at a later date, or are we to pass a resolution on what is in front of us as this the uh, the sixth story. That, that's all we can really do, Phil, because we haven't had the, the time or the opportunity to review any alternate schemes. And I'll leave it to Greg to explain if there is any sort of 
a procedural way forward um, if there is a material change in terms of the number of stories affecting heights and views and that type of thing. All right, maybe we'll just deal with that at the end. Or maybe we'll deal with that at the end. Uh, Mr. Chair, through, through you, why don't I just clarify that now because we want to make best use of the panel's time and, and the applicant's time. So the presentation that um, the architect should be providing to the panel is how they've responded to um, the feedback that they received on Oct October 20th. In addition to all the materials that have been shared with the panel in advance, you've spent the time uh, reviewing as part of your due diligence. and. I think the intention as it relates to a potential four story concept is something that would have to be brought back to the panel. And I think it was more just um, wanting to acknowledge where the project may need to go if the feasibility of this project as being presented today doesn't work out. So I, I, I really don't think the scope of focus should be on this revised proposal and not on this four story alternative. I don't want to muddy the waters uh, Absolutely. With, with today's meeting. Mr. So, Chair. I, if I could add a comment just for clarity's sake, you absolutely will be seeing the uh, proposed five story with parkade option, the detail, the suites, the layouts, uh, all of those elements form and character. We simply felt it was important if the panel um, had the opportunity to see what another option might be, then they could comment on that. The basic form and character, design, uh, landscaping, all of those would be exactly the same for both options. It is only the number of suites and cutting it down a floor. So uh, we should proceed with the revised submission that you have had a chance to see, and we will very quickly cover the other one at the end without getting into any more detail than that. That's wonderful. We'll, we'll look at it as a, as a preview then, um, if necessary. But I appreciate the clarification. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Okay. So yeah, uh, to be clear again, the, the, the presentation is really focused on the five-story plus parkway exposed uh, level of parkade, and, and there's just a couple slides at the very end of the presentation where we speak to the, the four-story option. So um, we're really focusing on the five-story option here today. Um, okay. So the, the project has been resigned to 103 unit a uh, fixed story residential development. Now the six story classification is, is strictly a building code classification because um, the, the lower level of parkade is exposed toward the south end and it's exposed in a way that it needs to be counted as a, a story from a building code perspective. But from all design and mapping and the purposes, it's a five story building, which actually um, improves to, to just over a four story building at the north end due to the natural grade of the site. Um, hold on. Here we go. Okay, so getting into a little bit more of the, the details here, the, the, the gross floor area has been reduced from the original application from around 89,000 square feet to just over 77,000 square feet. Uh, the parkade area has also been reduced. Um, as Greg mentioned, uh, we're, we're no longer working for a parking variant, um, but we were able to reduce the parkade area because the requirement came down so much. Uh, so we dropped roughly 10,000 square feet from the from the parkade area. This is a bit more of a detailed breakdown, which I won't go uh, through. But here's our, our unit count breakdown. So 103 units total. We've got 12 studios. We've got 41 one-bedroom units, 23 two-bedroom units, and then 21 three-bedroom units. 14 of those have designed to meet uh, adaptable uh, living requirements. Uh, this is, the sheet kind of just breaks down some of the key items that we that we redesigned from the initial application. Uh, the, these first ones are from the building form perspective. Eric's going to get to some of those in a bit more detail uh, as we go through. But at a high level, uh, we removed all the roof pop-ups um, except over the feature ones at the entries and exit stairs uh, just to reduce the massing of the building. Uh, we removed the rooftop amenity from the sixth floor level. We removed the exterior exit stairs from the first and second level. Uh, we removed all exterior deck columns by redesigning the facade and then bringing in the facade of the building. Um, we removed indoor amenity space from level two. Um, cut back all the decks and so, or, sorry, cut back all the decks in the top facade other than the rooftop amenity outdoor spaces. Uh, we straightened and reduced the depth of all the decks and the frame projections again to bring the massing of the building down. Uh, and we reduced the height of the the feature entry uh, frame above the entry lobby. Uh, from a floor plan and unit layout perspective, uh, we've cut back the fifth floor 
um, to the to the lobby. So on the south side, we removed the units off of that top level and really pulled it back to to increase the stepping from of the building from from south working its way towards the north. We've cut back level five on the the west side of the building as well. So we're only actually providing seven units on the fifth level plan, and we've tiered it down to four stories. Um, on the, the west side of the building to, to reduce the impact on the na neighboring development to the west. I'll get into a little bit more detail on that as we go through. Um, I think Greg mentioned we, con we consolidated some of our two bedroom and studio and one bedroom units. I changed the, the unit mix somewhat to, to get rid of some of the smaller units and increase the number of three bedroom units. Um, so uh, we've reduced the overall unit count by 26 units from 129 to 103 and uh, provided an additional seven uh, three bedroom units in this building. Uh, this is just a neighborhood context uh, plan. Uh, this is our site located here uh, with the star just on the edge of the town center transition and land use designation. Uh, these blue lines around here uh, just highlight the major arterial transit routes. Uh, the purple line here is the border between the city of Surrey and White Rock. We provided five minute and 10 minute uh, walking radius circles on here so we can get an idea of some of the amenities that are provided within the uh, walking radius of the site. And some of the amenities include the White Rock Promenade. Uh, there's a few parks, a um, couple of grocery stores, White Rock Community Center, White Rock Elementary School, Centennial Park, Sam Yam Shopping Center, as well as the White Rock Pier, which is just outside the 10 minute walking uh, circle. This is our highlighting our transit roads um, where public transit is available. Again, our site uh, located here. Uh, Thrift Avenue is actually designated as a 15 minute uh, bus route. So that's directly uh, on the frontage of our property. And then we've got a less than 15 minute bus route uh, within a five minute walk uh, up here on the North Bluff, which is uh, delineated by this red line here. Uh, pedestrian and cycle routes around our site. So again, Thrift Avenue is a, does have a bike lane on it. So that's directly on the front of our property. Um, safe pedestrian routes are provided on both uh, Thrift Avenue as well as Vidal. And we, we are giving up a substantial road dedication as part of this development uh, to allow for a new sidewalk and boulevard to be provided along the frontage of our building. Uh, there's also going to be uh, pedestrian cropping improvements at the intersection of Vidal and Thrift Avenue as part of the development. So it's just uh, aerial showing you more context. Our, our project site is located here, just to the south of the Beverly Building, which is a pretty high profile building in, in White Rock. Um, some of the surrounding um, uses and uh, of our site on the north side, we have multifamily uh, complexes as well as some commercial retail uses. On the east side, we have Vidal Street, obviously, then multifamily complexes on the east side of Vidal. Along south, we have Thrift Avenue and multifamily complexes uh, on the south side of Thrift. Now on the west side, we have some seniors housing, um, multifamily complexes, as well as some institutional buildings as we head a little bit further west. And just one final uh, context plan, this aerial shows our building location here, the Vidal on the, the east side and trip along the south. Uh, some of these images is the Vidal uh, looking uh, south along our property line, the Vidal looking north along our property line. Uh, this is basically from the intersection of Thrift and Vidal looking up towards our site. Uh, this is from Vidal looking uh, west along our north property line. You can see the edge of the Beverly building here, as well as large trees that Greg had mentioned. Uh, Kirk Avenue looking uh, west, and then Vidal Street looking south. Again, uh, Beverly located here, the large trees which we are uh, making sure to, to retain, and then our building would be just the south of these large trees. So this is our site plan. Uh, the main access to the building is located here. Uh, kind of halfway along the building frontage off of Vidal Street. Uh, parkade access is located here towards the southern end of the site where the parkade becomes exposed. Uh, this location has been fully vetted by our traffic consultant, our civil engineer, as well as a White Rock um, engineering department, and everyone is, is happy with this location. Um, I did want to highlight the, the setback uh, on our building. We've pulled the building back further from the north and west uh, property lines just to, to reduce the impacts on the neighboring development. So the, this dotted line here along the north and the west is the, the required setback, setback in, a, in a typical multifamily zone. And we pulled back our buildings substantially further away from the property lines just to mitigate the implications or the impacts on the, the surrounding developments. 
Um, this slide speaks to the tree we mentioned. So Greg mentioned that there's there's large stands of, of existing substantial trees on the north end of the uh, property as there is on the west side. So we've actually designed our parquet to, to notch in and out um, and stay away from those root balls. I think everyone's aware uh, large substantial trees are, are very valuable and, and they should be retained wherever possible. So the developer and, and us, we worked really hard to, to design the parquet in such a way as not to impact the health of those trees. Uh, I think the stands of uh, trees are very important. They're going to act as natural buffers between our development and any of the neighboring developments. Um, so retaining the, the health of those trees was very important, which we're, we're happy that we were able to accommodate. Uh, this slide is a little bit about our internal programming. So our site plan here again, uh, by Dallas Street, we have pedestrian walkout uh, units on the first floor uh, to, to increase the pedestrian connectivity uh, with the street from our building. Uh, number two here is our main entrance to the building is located here again, kind of halfway along the frontage of by Dallas Street. And we've located our indoor and outdoor amenity space along the southern portion of the building uh, just to, to take advantage of, of getting more sunlight into those. Uh, the unit breakdown kind of went over again, so I won't touch on that here again. Just highlights the percentages of the, the unit breakdown. Uh, from a parking perspective, we've kind of gone over some of this, but for the 103 units, we require 155 parking stalls uh, with our redesign. Um, we obviously decreased uh, the unit count, so we're no longer going for a parking variance, which was, which was a big part of our initial application. We're providing 169 parking stalls, so we're actually exceeding the parking bylaw by 14 stalls. Uh, from a bike parking perspective, we require 124 and we're providing 143. So we're exceeding our bike parking requirement here as well. So I've already touched on the electric vehicle uh, charging station requirement. There's 18 required and we're providing 19 um, hard wire breaks in the start. But it's important to note that we are roughing in uh, for all the stalls in the development to be electric uh, vehicle charging in the future. So that includes conduit to each of, of the um, of the stalls, as well as overall electrical service to the development to allow, um, it's going to be sized to allow for future 100% um, EV charging in the building. Just getting into the overall floor plans, I'll go through these pretty uh, quickly. Um, our P2 level, this is where the parkade uh, becomes exposed towards the felt end. So we have our parkade ramp entry here, uh, loading zone and garbage and recycling facilities located directly adjacent to, to the entry ramp. Again, that's all been vetted by traffic and the engineering department and everyone's uh, quite happy with the design. Uh, the first portion of the parkade as you come in would be dedicated to the visitor parking stalls. You go through a secondary secure gate that takes you into the other portions of the parkade where the resident stalls are located. So you come through this gate here and ramp down to P3, which is fully dedicated to uh, resident parking stalls. And then on this side, you would ramp up um, to get to P1 level here with another gate here, which takes you into the secured uh, residential portion of the parkade here. Our bike uh, parking facilities are, are provided on the P1 level in this room here. And then we, at the P1 level, we've started to incorporate uh, residential units um, at this level as the parquet becomes exposed uh, heading from, from north to south. Obviously, we didn't want to expose parquet all the way along this portion, but we kind of tiered down the residential uh, to help screen and, and wrap around uh, the parquet level. Uh, this is our first floor plan and main entry to the building located here with our elevator lobby, kind of located central on the building to, to avoid uh, travel distances within the building. Um, indoor amenity space is located on this level uh, here towards the south, as I mentioned, and then outdoor amenity space directly adjacent in this location here. Uh, second, third, and fourth floor plans are all basically identical. They're all just strictly uh, residential units, so I'll just skip through those. And then we really want to highlight this fifth level plan. So uh, this is where uh, the big portion of the, the changes to the original design happens. We pulled off all of the units from the southern portion of the building and provided uh, a large outdoor amenity deck space. And then we've also pulled off all of the units on the west side of the fifth level um, and provided um, private outdoor patio spaces for the units on this level. So as I mentioned, there's seven units up on this fifth level and there's uh, seven private outdoor um, patio areas. Now we pulled back the private uh, patio areas from the edge of the deck as well. As you can see here, the edge of the deck would be uh, further west. We pulled them back and provided a large landscape planter buffer just to really 
um, increase the, the private uh, nature of those bases and making sure that there's no overlooking uh, down onto the, the development to the west. Um, from a, a structural system standpoint, this is very much simplified from, from our initial application. So it really is a conventional um, wood frame apartment building on multiple levels of concrete parquet. So um, our parquet level, we have concrete structural columns, um, we have exterior stone side architectural columns and composite metal panel frames. Our floor systems, again, for the, uh, the parquet levels are obviously made out of concrete. And then for the residential levels, it's all just wood frame floors. Um, we're providing concrete papers um, to the exterior roof decks and patio spaces, uh, exterior walls. And for the, 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 the parquet portions, we have concrete uh, foundation walls. Um, but for the residential levels, it's all wood frame exterior walls and interior walls, uh, various exterior finishes, including composite metal panel, fiber cement panel, and stone. Uh, just a little bit about our site security and theft head, uh, the key principle that we incorporate into the design, um, natural access control, uh, access uh, only along Lydell Street with clear building signage along Thrift Avenue, uh, natural surveillance, so the building's elevated above grade, giving the building occupants a good vantage point of, of the street facing elevations, a territoriality, we proposed um, grading and landscape uh, as raised, uh, and sorry, the, the building access point above the street level, yeah, so that's again uh, just just trying to delineate private space from public space uh, by raising uh, the, the units from street elevation. And from SEPTED perspective, uh, dark sky compliant uh, exterior lighting fixtures are going to be provided throughout the ground plane uh, to help with visual identification of people as they come and go from the site. And then uh, private access controls at all the building entrances, including the parkade entrance, are going to be provided. This is a couple of quick cross sections. Uh, section A is a east-west cross section through the building. Obviously the three levels of parquet. Uh, this is the upper fifth level plan where um, we show the outdoor uh, private uh, decks here on the west side. So you can see the enlarged setback from the west property line as well as just the four stories of residential facing uh, west and then tiered uh, back to the fifth story. Uh, as you go vertical. And this second cross section is a, a north south cross section. Again, you can see how we kind of step down the residential um, portion of the building to work with the natural grade, as well as uh, keeping uh, a really five or five story building mass and form uh, along the south um, elevation. So, this week I'm going to turn over to Eric uh, to discuss the exterior uh, design concept. Thank you, Lucas. Yeah, you can see by the, uh, these, these revised elevations, the original concept of the design uh, was intended to sort of be stepping up from the south up to the north with these projecting cascading decks. Uh, so providing a sense set of entry like step natural cliffs out of the hillside. So the idea was to try to allow this building to really be sort of married into the into the slope of the land. Um, and so and doing so and in responding to the previous comments we've sort of split the building down the middle and stepped it down so we actually drop the south part of the building and so it, it, it actually reads more like two smaller buildings rather than one large building broken up by the main entry lobby and the glazing that's uh, that's located there <clears throat> the other thing that's that's done is a reduced scale of the ground plane to sort of uh, exemplify a little bit more of a townhouse expression along the street. So those ground uh, ground oriented units will feel like uh, their, their, their main entries into small units. And then the upper floor is second to fourth are uh, set back a little bit or perceived to be set back by some of the masking you'll see as we get into some of the other images to sort of create a sort of a, an appearance of actually a, a lower building, a four story building as you step back. And then the top floor, uh, uh, essentially sort of disappears into the background so it appears like it's much smaller smaller building tiered planters of stone and concrete um, are applied along the east facade at those ground oriented suites uh, and it leads pedestrians kind of down to the entrance which uh, which we feel provides a much more intimate pedestrian experience along by down um, and then uh, and maybe just put the next slide there you can see a, a toward the north and the south elevations are much more discreet as it relates to the site. Next slide. So this kind of going back to the natural grading of the site, uh, allowing sort of expansive views from 
from the uh, the units and from these larger balconies, which we've now reduced, but it's still this cascading effect we feel gives uh, a lot uh, a lot greater exposure and daylighting into the units and uh, respecting the neighbors and, and uh, so well, that excuse me can you can you hear me I'm getting yeah. incredible feedback I can't understand a lot of the last minute or two oh, okay so I don't even know who was speaking sorry about that but I don't want to I want to make sure I understand everything okay so sorry. who was who was speaking it's Eric Parklater I'm principal okay. here I, I've been getting uh Echo, I would call it. I don't know if other people were getting it, um, but it got worse. It seemed to get worse on that last part about yeah. the step downs. Yeah, it seemed all right for over here, Phil. Uh, so I don't know if uh, Greg or any other panel members, are you having any problems it's all, with your audio? It's all it's all right for me too. No problem. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, so all right, I'll try to adjust my sound then. Okay. okay. Thank you, Phil. Thanks, Sorry, Eric. Please go okay. ahead. Yeah. Oh, no problem. Uh, maybe just let's go to the next slide here. So this is kind of going back to the first slide we saw where it's a, so, so we started to really spend a bit more time looking at the site context and the adjacent buildings, particularly the one to the north, the 12 story uh, Beverly building and uh, how our design can better respond to, uh, to that, uh, that building and, and other buildings in the area. Um, one of the one of the aspects is just the materiality itself, the use of uh, colored panel, and uh, and also the masking along the ground plane, and more particularly the strong horizontality of that building. And we felt, that, as you see in some of these other images, that we thought to carry that horizontality down. And and then the other thing is just the sense of stepping down as the hill steps down, respecting the views and uh, and the architecture of the existing building. Maybe the next slide here. Here's some images of the, of the building to the north, and uh, we just sort of responded to the massing, um, some of these sort of ground, uh, you know, uh, ground plane sort of massing that projects out, that sort of creates these sort of box elements that reduce the scale along the street. Um, and then also where the uh, where there's a long, strong vertical element breaking up the length of the facade, you can see that glazed element there. So we'll go to the next, uh, next slide. So we've done that here as well where we're trying to sort of uh, bring a reduced height, stepping down, and then again, breaking up the facade and picking up on that stepped approach uh, from the one building to the other and to get down to thrift avenue. The other thing that we felt to do was to really neutralize and use some of the coloring in this building um, to sort of uh, complement the other building and not compete with it. Um, so more natural uh, elements and natural materials uh, Color, more muted and gray tone colors uh, to that, but yeah, with some wood and wood features still uh, to sort of bring that warm. So now going over to the colors and the material that the was oh, here is uh, again a little bit more on the on the masking and the and the and the expanded outdoor spaces. So just in terms of materiality, we uh, we really felt to. Uh, uh, use a natural sort of uh, palette of materials combined with a modern uh, contemporary material sort of to, to sort of uh, bring some modern, uh, modern to, the, to the building yet keep that sort of traditional warmth of a west coast type building um, so we used uh, a lot of uh, wood trim and timber elements still you see them along the uh, main entry uh, and then through it in the fascias and and actually mostly along the uh, the ground floor units uh, as we get into some of the closure images, you'll see how it's developed there. Wood slab features in some of the areas where there's large expanses of walls, again, bring warmth, bring an opportunity for planting along the wall. Stone veneer along the ground plane um, to strengthen that ground plane and, and uh, tie it in with the uh, with the landscaping. Um, and then and then exemplify sort of uh, accentuating the, uh, the main entrance with the with the dark flat stone panel. And then picking up on the Beverly materiality with some of that metal panel, uh, you can see on those on those box arches that are around the second to third floor. And these are just some of the uh, the images. So uh, the importance of again the ground floor. Maybe go to the next one as well. Um, feeling uh, very uh, sort of pedestrian friendly as each of these ground floor units uh, have in their own entries into into their uh, into their spaces from the street. In the sidewalk and it's, it creates an impermeable uh, sort of a, a more of a, a permeable approach along the street. 
Uh, having said that, I think we'll turn it back to Lucas to. Yeah, there, there's just, just a few more slides here that kind of reflect some of the exterior changes. So uh, this is a revised uh, application masking on the, the image on the top here uh, versus the initial application below. So I won't go through these in too much detail. You can see the, the substantial change in, in roof pop ups and just general masking along the facade um, and height of the building as it works its way south. Um, and then similarly, this is uh, the same type of slide from the WEX perspective uh, with the revised application on top, uh, the reduced pop ups and, and the, the tearing down of, of the fifth level uh, to a four story building facing west. So you can see on this, this upper image, um, the, the fifth level is, is barely visible from ground level uh, when facing the west elevation. So it really is a four story building. Uh, and then just a few views uh, from the, the north of our site. Kind of looking south, um, we, we took some drone shots uh, at various heights, and then this this would be roughly a uh, view a vantage point from the the eleventh floor of the Beverly Building, looking south over top of our building. Again, it's just a, a rough um, illustration of, of what that would look like. And similarly, uh, from the seventh floor um, of the Beverly Building, looking over top of our development. Uh, due to the sustainability principles uh, to run through here, uh, we've eliminated all surface asphalt and trying to maximize the density to lessen the heat island effect, uh, reduction in water usage in the development using low flush toilets and irrigation methods, uh, operable wind windows in the living areas of the units will offer passive ventilation, uh, electric car charging, we, we touched on that, we go there again, uh, greenhouse gas reduction due to close proximity to the transit system available to the site. Um, energy performance is going to meet or exceed ASHRAE uh, requirements and alternative transport uh, with the use of bikes that's promoted in the development. Uh, as you saw, we, we exceeded the, the bylaw requirement for bike parking in the development as well. Okay, at this stage, uh, we're going to get to the landscape portion. David, are you there to jump in? Yeah, I am. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Dave Jerky with Van Zaman Associates. So yeah, I'll take you quickly through the landscape package. Um, I think Eric and Lucas did, did a really good job of touching on most of the major features that kind of shape this site. Um, so we can either uh, share our screen or do you, do you think this will work to just roll through your shared screen? Is that is that our approach here? Yeah, let's just screen? let me know when to switch slides or to sure. switch and I'll, I'll switch. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So yeah, uh, next slide, please. So yeah, as discussed earlier, a big component of this from the landscape architecture pers perspective is really retaining those large western red cedar and dug fir trees on the north and west sides of the site. Um, so we've worked extensively with the extensively with the architecture team on carving back the barcade, making sure the root zones are not impacted, um, talking about how we're going to shore those those areas and install the parkade, and, and really discussing the, the long term viability of those trees on site. So we've done quite a bit of work there and we've got some sections in the package later on, but this really shows how we're intending to pull back that parkade wall. So next slide, please. Um, overall, we'll start at the we'll start at the low end on the south side and work our way north. Uh, this this particular site is as kind of been has been discussed is really an exercise in how we reduce break down the scale of a very steep uh, urban frontage. So we're working to tier the landscaping on on both the south and the east sides uh, to create more of a a, you know, a friendly view from the urban realm as well as a setback from the street to not overshadow uh, different sides. So you can see that kind of along the, the, the south patio space there, as well as the tiered landscaping on the east. And, and further on in the package here, we have a few sections where I can talk to you about those a little bit further. Um, we've outlined all the materials on all the pages, but we're really looking at, 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 at materials that complement the architecture, um, natural tone colored pavers, uh, hydro press slabs, uh, and then integrated lighting that will work with the lighting of, uh, of, the, uh, of the exterior of the building. So next slide, please. So this is as you head north, um, you're seeing a bit more uh, landscape treatment along the east edge with those kind of townhome frontages. We're looking at creating individual entries with you know marked, marked landscaping so you can recognize those as individual features as well as lar large patios on the west side surrounded by trees to cr continue that, that kind of uh, treatment of large cedar or evergreen trees and, and trees that could buffer all the, the west and north side. So we'll have a continuous feel of a landscape treatment along that west edge. Um, as well as incorporating those existing trees. Um, we've looked through species that will um, survive underneath those large western dug, western red cedars and dug firs uh, and won't impact the root zones as they're shallow growing species that we've provided in those areas. So, um, in addition, sorry, last piece oh, on sorry. that one. No, that's good. Um, <laughs> The, uh, the the bike ramp and access, as you can kind of see it's split between the two different drawings there, uh, really working to incorporate the, the bike racks and bike access, as well as the pedestrian access to create a very visible and readable front entry. 
next page, please. Um, this is really the, the, the level two with the private outdoor amenity um, and patio spaces. So again, tiering back of the building, we're, we're creating a usable functional outdoor space for the residents. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this is the main outdoor amenity uh, it's connected. We've, we've provided a bit more programmable features in here to give a better idea of what we're uh, what we're thinking in terms of usage. So both children's play, passive um, outdoor use, such as lounging seating, and then uh, movable picnics, tables, and chairs for larger groups. Uh, when we're looking at features of this size for outdoor amenity, we're really focusing in on uh, different scales of groups or different types and uh, quantities of groups. So small seating areas versus larger lounging groups versus parents who might want to gather together. So there's all three different varieties provided in this particular outdoor amenity space. Uh, and then you see uh, that, that west uh, piece where we've carved the building back uh, from the west property line. We're adding an ample planting buffer as well as large scale trees to create that, that sense of, to reduce that sense of overlook on, on the western edge. So next slide, please. Um, this uh, particular slide really gets into the nuts and bolts of the grading. You're welcome to take a close look at this. It is a very complicated grading site. Uh, so we've gone through and, and, and graded out each landscape wall, uh, stairs, all the conditions to make sure we don't have any uh, conflicts in terms of ramps, grades, building code. Um, it's a fully detailed grading plan. So uh, this was probably a big, big part of our work on this one. So uh, next slide, please. Um, the planting palette itself is a mixture of, of native and non-native species. Um, there's plenty of pollinators and bird-friendly habitat in here, which is a, a major consideration in the lower mainland, trying to encourage pollinators. So we've got lots of uh, flowering and, and seasonal interest shrubs, uh, as well as some very hardy um, evergreen plants to provide year-round interest uh, in front of the main frontages. So the palette is fairly similar as you move up the building, um, but we're really trying to look at stuff that will be long-lasting, uh, provide that kind of year-round look and provide the habitat that we're looking for, as well as low irrigation needs. And and I can I can elaborate more on that if anybody has any questions on those particular species. So uh, next slide, please. Again, just uh, another planting plant working through the same similar palette. Next slide, please. And then the final uh, rooftop palette uh, planting plant. Next slide, please. Uh, some standard details for those of you who want to get into the nuts and bolts of, of how we, we we put together these particular facilities. Um, really talking about concrete on grade, hydropressed slabs, plant standard planting details. Next slide, please. Uh, as well as some of the features. So if you're looking into a bit more on what program we're expecting to see in those outdoor amenities, you're seeing that that outdoor play and surfacing, um, that kind of unique lounger sun shade swing. Um, we really like those as a as a group get together, as a family get together feature, as well as outdoor fire pits. Uh, and lounge seating. Next slide, please. And additional uh, outdoor seating opportunities. So long tables, bar seating. You're see, again, you're seeing the variety we talked about earlier in terms of different groups, different styles of seating, how, how to interact, as well as the indoor or outdoor kitchen. Next slide, please. And these next couple of slides just focus in on the, sec uh, the sections. I think um, Lucas and, er and Eric did a really good job of walking around the sides, but we wanted to just kind of elaborate that on, on how the landscape would tear down to grade. So this first section you're seeing from the south property line, how we've we've built up against the parkade wall to reduce the scale, uh, as well as provided landscaping in front uh, to try to create that tiered effect of, of green coming down the facade. Thanks. Slide. Um, and then you can see this this particular one focuses in on uh, the west property line and the scale difference or the size the size difference between the west property line as well as the tiering of the landscaping along the south uh, and west. Next slide, please. Uh, here you can see along the east property line that that change in grade where we've kind of changed between the two situations of going down into that those front patios and then being raised up as we head from from north to south and how we intend to green those particular. Uh, areas to allow for proper septed for views in while while providing a nice green uh, buffer from from the urban realm and from the sidewalk. So when you're walking past it on the street, you're seeing a nice lush landscape. Uh, section five really focuses in on that existing uh, cedar trees to the north that we're really trying to to protect and and how we're trying how we're pulling back the parkade wall and for giving them ample room within their critical root zone. So I believe that's it for us. Uh, any questions? And we're here. All right. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, yeah, so before we kick it back over to um, 
Oh, sorry, I got a good feedback. Uh, before we take it back over to Peter to wrap up, dude, we just want to touch on this, the four-story option. So again, I think Peter mentioned from a from a design standpoint, um, site planning, uh, building entry to the to the main entry of the building and the parkade entry, all of those components um, stay the same between the, the five-story and, and four-story option. Really, what we're doing is peeling out one of the, the intermediate uh, residential levels out of the building. So where this was, uh, this top upper plan was originally our, our fifth level plan, this becomes our fourth level plan. So we're still providing the same uh, cutting back of the building on the west side. So instead of a four story uh, uh, face uh, facing west, it's gonna be a three story face uh, with those uh, private outdoor uh, patios on top of that uh, third level and then only uh, seven units or eight units because we would be adding in a uh, one unit here in this red box area. Um, still tearing back uh, along the south as well and uh, providing outdoor amenity space, which would be uh, redesigned slightly, obviously. Um, but uh, for all intents and purposes, the, 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 the design of the site stays the same. It's, it's just really bringing down the mass of the building by taking out an entire residential floor. Um, so the numbers look a little different, obviously. So we'd be going from 103 units to 82 units in this option. Uh, we'd be dropping another 10,000 square feet roughly out, just a little bit over, uh, down to 66,000 square feet roughly. Um, the parking requirement is 125 solid, I believe, and we would be providing 129. Uh, so we're still exceeding the bylaw, um, but we are pulling the parkade a little bit uh, further out of the ground uh, because the parking requirement is, is lower, obviously, for the, the lower unit count. And then just some uh, rendering views of the four story option. Um, same tiering that we're, we're dealing with. Obviously, the slope of the site doesn't change, but we still have to deal with that. Um, but it's really just pulling out that one residential floor. Um, Peter, are you still there? I am still here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lucas, Eric, and David. Um, so to the panel, just a couple of really quick uh, wrap-up remarks. Uh, one of the things that uh, the developer has done throughout of the, this time is to do a fair amount of market analysis on size of units, affordability. And as you know, affordability becomes uh, somewhat in the eye of the beholder, but they've really taken a hard look at, uh, in this case, what affordability really means, and they've done their homework on that as well. The other big thing is that, uh, you know, the environmental um, footprint of this building, as has been very well laid out by the architect and the landscape architect. The other issues, of course, is accessibility and all of the issues uh, in this day and age because of the potential mixed residents that all of the accessibility issues have been addressed and it incorporates uh, a number of the amenities as you've already heard. What is also important, I think, and from, I know it isn't necessarily what ADP speaks to, but the construction management dimension of this project, Westone is very sensitive in ensuring that the current neighbors are as least disrupted as possible in terms of time management and also site management during the construction period. So there is a lot of issues that have been talked about, a uh, lot of input from the community that's been listened to, and what uh, we believe we have is a development that I said at the beginning, and I say this uh, with all sincerity, is something that the community could be proud of and meets what we're hearing, the issues and concerns that have been expressed by council and neighbors uh, to this site. So with that said, uh, Mr. Chair, we're going to turn it back over to you. I'm sure the ADP members have um, a lot of questions. We did a lot of community engagement uh, over the period, as you can see on this chart, um, and talked to a lot of people, not only neighbors, but businesses in the community and so on. Next slide. And again, this is sort of the image, and you can see how it fits uh, into the area, how it respects the neighbors, both on the north and the west side. And so I think, uh, again, the design has reflected what the community has said. So with that said, Mr. Chair, we're gonna turn it back to you and uh, any questions for the architects or the landscape architect on uh, from the panel. 
of course. Uh, thank you, Peter, and thank you to the design team. Um, I would just like to open with a simple comment that this is a markedly different uh, presentation than we received last time. It's much improved, um, but I won't uh, preempt any discussion. The first piece of order is to go through our panel with questions. Questions on content received, uh, pre-circulated, and any questions on the presentation that fleshed out any of that information in that content. Um, I would ask the panel, given the, the size and nature of the project, if you would kindly um, keep it to questions for this, and then we'll move briskly uh, beyond the questions and start going through individual member comments thereafter. So I will start. I will have to pick someone and put them on the spot. So I will pick uh, the vice chairperson, Paul Rust. Um, do you have any questions or anything in particular that uh, you would like addressed uh, for clarity by the presenters? Uh, you might be muted. I, I don't see your face here. Uh, so, um, sorry, uh, Greg, I can't see any faces on my screen, so I can't tell if Paul is speaking or if he's muted or not. Uh, yeah, through you, Mr. Chair, I will. Um, yeah, thank you. Fine, Paul. I don't know if someone else is touching buttons, but please don't. Oh, I see Paul's calling in. Oh, he might have lost him. Paul, are you calling in now? Y yes, I lost my connection. Okay. But I don't know why. No worries, Paul. So um, I don't know where, when we lost you, but we were at the stage now where we were looking specifically at questions relating to the pre-circulated material and the presentation uh, by the proponents and uh, seeing if you have, and limiting just to questions at this time, uh, do you have any questions for clarity or otherwise? Uh, no, I'm fine, thanks. Okay, thank you. And then moving to Nicholas um, Weisbluff. Nicholas, if you're there speaking, you're muted. Uh, so hearing none from Nicholas, unless we see him chime in, I don't see his, oh, he might have left the meeting there, Greg. He was going to be leaving early. So I'll move over to Rashir. Rashir? Yeah. Uh, um, okay. Uh, going through your material and also through the presentation, we were told that you've got concrete uh, uh, structure on the parkade level, and that's it's a uh, wood frame structure up top. I also see a lot of uh, trees on the rooftop uh, planters. So are those built up planters on the rooftop that are going to be accommodating those trees? As we know, most of the municipalities require 10 cubic meter of soil growing medium per tree. So is that going to be built up planter on a wooden structure? Would you confirm that? Yeah, it, it currently is shown as a, as a larger tree on a wooden structure. We'd have to work with structural to make sure that we can allow for the 10, 10 cubic meters, or we could go to a smaller scale uh, like Japanese maple. We've, we've done them on wooden structures in the past. You just have to be careful with the trees selected and ensure that you can pro provide the pro proper soil volume. Um, I know that the, yeah. the wood frame the wood yeah, frame then, construction doesn't le lend itself well to trees on the rooftop, but we have done it in the past. Yep. Yeah, but 10 cubic meters for uh, trees is, yeah, it, it, it has been done in the past, but it's, it's uh, people are moving away from it, as you know. So that was my question. Number two, in one of the presentation in the DA, DPA guidelines, uh, it's been written that landscape respects heritage and history. Could you talk to that? So I think the real way we're respecting the, the heritage and the history is working to retain the, the, the environmental history of the site by working with those existing trees. Like I think that from our perspective, that was our tie back to history was doing everything possible to keep that existing character on the site. Um, I think some of the architectural moves in terms of the stone facing as well do that, do a nice connection back to, to the heritage of the site. Uh, but from our perspective, it was really focused in on, on keeping the existing environmental heritage of the site, which was those existing trees. Yeah. Okay. Um, is it possible to put on the screen the northern part of uh, of the site a little bit? I wanted to ask about access to the green areas outside the patios. It's possible to bring that up. Greg, you want me to reshare my presentation? Yeah, Luke, I think that would be easiest. Thank you. 
Is, is there a particular page you were looking for, Rishir, for quick um, access? Okay. Uh, give me one second. I'm looking on my presentation to oh. tell you the page. It's L03B. Yeah, I think it's on screen now. OK, yeah, that's the one. So uh, if we see a lot of uh, green area outside the patios, is there some kind of a traffic control? Uh, because we were talking about uh, eyes on the street and all that stuff. Is there a fencing or a gate or something next to the PMT where the heritage trees are? One sees green uh, contiguous with the boulevard. Is there some sort of an access control there at all to go? That, that, that is something we could consider. Yes, I don't I'm, I'm I don't believe there is right now, but that is something we could consider for sure. As long as it doesn't affect as long as we are far enough away from the PMT that we meet the BC Hydro requirements, we could consider an access. We just have to leave that BC Hydro, uh, as you know, fully accessible. So, yeah. OK, and uh, you talked about uh, uh pulling the building back from north and uh, the west sides but i see a whole bunch of trees being planted next to the patio on uh, the north setback and uh northwest setback which kind of should make that area rather dark because it's on the northern side as well uh any uh, did you think about uh, opening that area up a little bit or we, we thought from our perspective, like the continuation of the, the, the trees was a nice connection between the, the two existing uh, kind of plots of trees that the, the, the kind of continuation. So it will be slightly darker, but I think being on the north side, that's a condition of just where you are. Um, even if we did remove those trees, I think it would still be a darker patio. So from our perspective, it was really about continue creating like one continuous kind of landscape tree corner. Uh, so we were really looking at kind of existing trees. We provide a new tree uh, connection and then the existing trees again on the west. Yeah. OK, can we now go to the rooftop level? Amenity level, thank you. Now, uh, there's a whole lot of programming out here in the amenity area that we see here. There's social seating, there's outdoor kitchen, there's dining stuff. Is there any facility you've thought about, like a storage room or a shed or uh, anything like that, that might be able to support such a, a wide selection of activities? We, we usually leave that to the um, to the strata or the building owner to determine if they want to provide storage out there. It's often if they want to secure it and have access to it. So uh, yes, there's a possibility for that and there's the space for that. Um, we just generally don't show it on our DP submissions because it's a, it's something that the owner chooses if they want to I provide. Think, I think that is that should be a part of uh, coordination with architecture. So it's a part of the building, I would think, rather than temporary strata shed or something like that, because this is quite a lot of stuff and there'll be a lot of requirements up here. And I would suggest if you kind of coordinate it with architects to kind of see if you can work something out. Sure. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, those were my questions. Thank, thank you, Rishi. And uh, moving on to other panel members, uh, Kay Kubaki, do you have any questions specific to the presentation or the materials circulating? Just, I'm just going to unmute. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, I do have a question about the, the top level of the building. It's nice to see the functional space where residents you know can dine outside or use that space um however there seems to be a bit of there's one side that is functional and a common space and then it looks like if i'm recalling this correctly seven individual private patios is that correct yeah that's correct okay so um do you foresee that that is going to be an issue with other residents in the building not having access to that to those private patios? Uh, so yeah, you've got I, I to select seven. 
That's all. <laughs> yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, and our, our, our way of dealing with that was to really provide a lot of really good program outdoor mini space for the, for all the residents in the building. Uh, there, there are a few units that have their own private outdoor space. Um, but we've designed the, the the communal outdoor mini space in such a way that it it really it, it's a lot of space and it, it's well programmed, so it should be very usable for for the other residents of the building. Okay. Um, and there's one space that is quite large for the outdoor patio. Is that because that is a three bedroom? Correct. Yeah, we, we've kind of uh, made the size of the private rooftop spaces uh, to match the size of, of the unit. So the bigger units have bigger uh, outdoor spaces and there's, a, there's one, one or two studio up on this level as well um, that has a smaller uh, private outdoor space. Okay. All right. And what is going to be separating the patios? Is it? Are you going to be using glass? Or? Yeah. I mean, there's the, there's obviously the landscape planters that, that separate each of them, but there will also be uh, some sort of a, a glazed fencing uh, type thing to, to to provide additional privacy between the patios. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Bay. So, uh, moving on to Sharon. Sharon, do you have any questions relating to the? to the presentation or the materials? Yes, um, actually, first of all, I'd like to thank um, thank the presentation. It was, um, it's it's really, from my perspective, broken it down into a um, a, a building that is, ex that looks um, like the way you described it. I, I, I appreciate that. I wanted to ask when Greg was initially speaking about the, um, the changes and wanting 50% of the building to be rental, which all new buildings are fully rentable. But are you talking about that half of the building is not to be sold and it will be managed by the developer or is it a then becomes a different level? I'm just confused about that comment. Through you, Mr. Chair. So the policy that relates to um, that 50%, so it's that 40% increase to the maximum permitted floor area may be uh, provided where at least 50% of the additional floor space is uh, tied to rental tenure housing. So the way that the city would secure that, so as I had mentioned in, in responding to some of uh, Phil's comments about the zoning, so the zoning amendment in this case is to introduce a property specific CD zone and through this process we're able to add uh, condition and conditions and terms that are specific to the, the the zoning that we create through this process. So one thing that we would do um, under the current policy framework is we would say that um, X percent of the units have to be secured as rental tenure for the life of the building. And we would, that would be a zoning control that speaks to rental tenure. It's often referred to as rental tenure zoning. Um, so we would, we would establish that as a limitation within the property specific CD zone. Um, as a way of enabling the additional density that they get. I understand that part. When when you say it needs to be secured as tenure rental, does that mean one ownership that they can't because stratas or new buildings are all 100% rentable? Are you talking about on the developer's disclosure when they get their permit? Or are you speaking that an outside or the developer retains the ownership of those suites only? So one ownership and they're all rentable and they are not ever to be sold. Is that is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. So through you, Mr. Chair, we haven't done a lot of these, but I believe the intention would be that you don't have, for example, um, 103 stratified units with X percent of those being rented out by multiple owners. It would be that you block aside um, that 50 percent of the 40 additional GFA within one uh, one ownership entity, if that makes sense. So let's say it works out to 20 units needing to be secured as rental tenure. The expectation would likely be that they're being held by the same owner. Okay, okay. Um, another quest, um, sorry, I did have another okay. question about, oh, the parking. So I, I appreciate the, um, the, the, the changes in the parking, but realistically moving ahead and definitely a lot of the new ownership is millennials and a lot of them don't drive. And we are seeing a lot of people that need less cars. This is on a transit route. Um, 
so I'm a little confused why the parking had to be in, in, increased and I, I am understanding that this is going to be a very, um, it, it will be mixed age, there is, it, it can be all kinds of different ownership, but moving ahead into the future, it's, it's less, um, less vehicles, but anyways, that's neither here nor there. Um, I thought that was interesting. And I, um, I, I do appreciate you showing us the four story uh, version because um, I think in, in all honesty, the five story is a much nicer looking building and is less, is more interesting and less blocky. And um, what we need is, is definitely the interest so that it blends into the scenery, which I, I believe it does. And I think it's a, um, I just wanna thank you for your presentation. That's all I have to say. Thank, thank you, Sharon. And we'll return back uh, for specific comments later on, on on the specific design aspects. Um, last but not least on our panel is Phil. Do you have any specific questions, particularly relating to the to the information circulated in the presentation? You're muted, Phil. Still, still muted. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And I apologize before it must have been my head my headset. I, know I can hear you better without it. Um, the uh, yeah, I do have some very specific and, and perhaps the answer. I'm getting feedback from somebody. Okay. Um, the uh, and I think it'd be short answers. Uh, this is uh, primarily focused on the letter, which I appreciated from the ADP comment response which we only received. Uh, this is one point by point, and I appreciated uh, that information, but I need clarity on some of them. So with respect to the, uh, this has to do with the, the, the footprint, basically, and the relationship in part, it's about the trees, but, but can, I, can you mute? Okay. Uh, is it me? Three, sorry, through you, Mr. Chair, I, I'm trying to mute um, Paul. I, Paul, I, I think it's turning, taking you off a of mute every time you speak, but we're getting a lot of feedback from your phone in, so I don't know if you can mute the phone. But I, I've muted that Colin. It just seems like every, it's it's unmuting him every time there's a rattle on the phone or something. Okay, let me. Talk. That's better for me. Okay, thank you. Um, so on the first point about the impacts on the trees and so on, but what it sparks is this, this question about the, the footprint. Is the footprint exactly the same as we saw in October? I just want to be clear about that. Is it the same? And if not? It is, it, no, it's not, it's not the same. It's been pulled back a little bit further from the north uh, property line. From the north, but the, the reason I'm asking that is it looked to me that on the north side, that the that the the parking the, the foundation by those trees was right at the edge of the protected root area and it still seems to be the same that's why i'm confused by the comments that were made so if Sorry. we go back to the original design back in october was that north basically it's the Parkade, I guess the, the foundation wall for the uh, at the parkade on the north wall is that in the same location as in October uh, the October presentation. Yeah, sorry, I'm just so I'm just opening up the original application drawings here so we can take a look. Uh, yes, the parkade wall is in the same location along the north as it was in the original application. Okay, so that has not changed, and the same thing on the west wall. If I'm not mistaken, uh, yes, it looks like that's right. Okay, okay it's the same. So the, the the with respect to those those are important trees owned by the property owners to the north, whether that's the city or the Beverly or it's on the west side. Um, has anybody independently, like the city arborist, reviewed the viability of those trees, given that the that the parkade is coming right up to the edge, as well as the issue of sunlight. I don't think we know if that's going to be an issue or not. The the last loss of sunlight. So so it's really about the roofs. Has the city arborist reviewed any of that? 
Yes, through you, Mr. Chair, the Arbicultural Technician for the City has reviewed different iterations of the Arbus report. Um, I think now we're on iteration number four or five with the intention of making sure that the trees that are identified for retention can actually be retained. So um, to your point, I think, Phil, the critical root zone around the trees to be protected is essentially at the edge of the, um, the parkade. And, and one of the things we typically look at is ability to excavate um, and still remain outside of the critical root zone. So that has been a comment of the city's agricultural technician. And it is something that we are uh, still working through on the technical side. There are um, controls that can be um, implemented to make sure that they don't encroach into the critical root zone. So it's not something at this point that we see as a as as a showstopper. Let's say I think it is something that we can resolve through um, a continued dialogue on the technical pieces. But uh, that has been something that we have looked at, Phil. Okay, thank you. Uh, the, when I go to the composition of the roof materials, uh, which is something that we raised, it says, um, "Can uh, is the roof going to be dark? The roof materials. I'm not. There's a comment about gray, dark gray uh, membranes, and I'm not sure what pavers would be used. Are those light or dark colored?" Higher roof is well, this is the upper roof, not not the rooftop, uh, not the rooftop amenity spaces. I'm assuming you're talking about the the it'd be the the roof on top of the fifth floor, the, the, the highest, highest roof. Floor level, the highest roof. Um, yeah, it can be a mixture of. Oh. Go. Um, is it white? I'm, I'm afraid that's you, Bill. So I can't hear you, Bill. We can't hear you, and I don't think you can hear us. You can't hear me. Uh, you're off and on. Okay, is it light or dark? And I was getting a great deal of, rever of reverberation from their room, I think. Maybe you weren't. Yeah, it's, it's, it's likely going to be a mixture. We've been, we've been having some conversations of actually providing a bit of a pattern up there. So it won't just be black or white, but it'll likely have some sort of pattern assigned to it. The mixture of I just mean, okay. So just one clarification, not a comment. Um, the uh, the smallest we made a comment about the size of units, uh, and I and that was in the original presentation. And there was the smallest unit was 323 square feet, uh, and there were some other comments about the uh, size of units less than a thousand. What is now the very the smallest unit, which I presume would be a studio? That's not in the material. Yeah, the the small unit would still be the same square footage as it was in the original application. It's just we've changed the overall unit mix, so we're providing less of those small units and more of the larger units. Okay, thank you. Um, just trying to be efficient here. Um, and in the last, we didn't make this a comment, but you made it as a comment about accessibility, I think. In our meeting before, you said it has not been addressed. This is about uh, this uh, accessibility for uh, disabilities. Um, I know you you have adaptable units, but I, is it now? Do the do the plans, which I couldn't see, it wasn't clear to me about accessibility to. I mean, we have an older population here. Uh, is that now fully formed and has that been reviewed uh, to meet? I'm not sure what our bylaw requirements are. Yeah, I mean, the full building is 100% is handicap accessible. So there's the ramps at, at the front entry, all of that is provided. Um, the the adaptable units is a bit of a different thing. So we're providing uh, 13 uh, adaptable units, which are designed in such a way, bigger doorways and, and thresholds and, and um, Clearance in bedroom, that sort of thing, to allow for kind of aging in place. So it's clear. So the 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 ramp to the, there'd be a ramp to the entrance way. Correct. Way. And if I'm not mistaken, from my looking at the that along Vidal, there are some entrances that are stepped, but there are others that are ramped. Uh, correct. Yeah. So some of the cadets from the, the first four units facing Vidal will have. Uh, either steps up or down. So there wouldn't be necessarily an individual ramp for each of those units, but there definitely is a communal ramp at the front entry of the building. So you would gain access to the unit uh, through the front entry and, and, and through the corridor. Okay, but so all of that has now been uh, defined. As Correct. Yeah. Uh, let me just quickly make sure I haven't changed. Um, 
Now, this is, did not come up. It just may be a simple question. Has this been reviewed for the Energy Step program? Um, not specifically, uh, but it is, now that we're, we're dealing with the conventional wood frame apartment building, which we deal with quite a bit, um, we're, we're very confident that we can meet the step code requirements that that White Rock has. Okay. Um, I think that's all. I'll have comments, but I think that's for clarifications. Thank you. Th thank you, Bill. Um, now, I just have a couple additional questions, just building on some of the other questions that were asked. Um, so when I'm looking at the unit mix, can you just confirm that you, you're showing 14 adaptable suites, but those are all three bedroom suites. Can you confirm that uh, none of the lower bed count uh, suites are adaptable? Yeah, not as currently designed, no. Might be something to consider, but we'll leave that yeah, for comments. Yeah, it's, it's a valid point for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, next question um, uh, is with with respect to the write up versus what I'm seeing on screen. I, I, I believe I read somewhere that um, he, that there were rooftop units planned and potential screening for those rooftop units. Is that something that's been uh, just for now because it hasn't been designed omitted from? Uh, the presentation material. The, the reason I'm asking is because uh, typically the screening around rooftop units will add to the perceived mass and height of the building. Um, so Keystone, were those um, were those considered at all? Uh, we, we don't have the input from our mechanical consultant on that quite yet, but we're hopeful that we can actually locate those units on, on the lower level. So kind of on the, the, the roof of the fourth floor level as opposed to at the very top roof on top of the fifth floor. Um, there, we have excess space up there as it is, but we're, we're hopeful that we can locate the units on that and screen them from, from the outdoor amenity spaces that are provided at that level. Um, that would keep them uh, at a lower exposure uh, to the surrounding uh, streets and, and developments. I appreciate that. I think that um, you might find, depending on what strategy you used for your mechanical systems, that that would be something that would have a large impact on those spaces. Uh, similar to the to the storage rooms upstairs uh, that we talked about. Um, last question here, although actually no, I, I'll ask a question through to Greg. Um, again, building off of Phil's question, um, what is the requirement City of White Rock with respect to step code uh, for rezoning? Uh, so the through you, Mr. Chair, the the city has not adopted uh, step codes. Um, it is something that we've been tasked to do through council. Um, but we haven't had the capacity or, or the opportunity to to do so. So we are currently only require design in alignment with the BC Building Code requirements. Okay, thank you. And lastly, um, and, and I'm sure it's it'll be answered uh, within the future development of the proposal. Um, but with the large number of outdoor amenity spaces here, uh, just thinking about sound sound attenuation um, and and uh, enjoyment of suites. Um, can the architectural group comment on if there are any special measures being taken to mitigate uh, sound transmission through this building? Uh, we haven't uh, incorporated it at this stage, but I, I know this is definitely on West Stone's radar. We've had a couple conversations. We haven't designed anything specifically for it, but I would imagine things such as improved improve performance of windows uh, facing those outdoor many spaces would be big um, and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so nothing specifically designed at this uh, stage, but it's definitely on our radar and on the owner's radar as well. Okay, thank you. Um, that's it for my questions. Um, I'll just ask the panel one last time on questions before we move to comments generally. Uh, Peter, did you have a comment? Did you want to yes, I did very quickly, uh, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to reinforce one of the things that uh, a couple of the panel members talked about is the building and the size of units have been designed for people to actually age in space. So in the future, someone, you know, if you had an older couple and one of them uh, was to pass, that there would be the opportunity for that uh, single individual then to age in space in the same building. Uh, and that is a whole new trend that uh, the developer has definitely uh, incorporated into their thinking for the future as well. Thank you, Peter. Yeah, and, uh, sorry, who's speaking? Yeah, it's Paul Rust. Oh, hi, Paul. Um, yeah, the, the my communications here is rather garbled. I apologize for that, but That's okay. I have to blame Shaw. Anyway, <laughs> um, 
I had a couple of things that I would like to bring up uh, that have been already touched on. The BC housing guidelines uh, specify certain minimum standards for uh, the sizes of units, including, you know, some dimensions and bedrooms, et cetera, et cetera. And I think in this particular uh, presentation in the plans, I see some areas where they come short of meeting the minimum standards of the BC housing guidelines. Uh, one of the things that also I noticed was on, uh, if you look at unit D2, for instance, uh, <clears throat> 409, if you like, in the plan, you'll see there that the there's a bedroom there where you can't get around the bed because of one of these little funny little quirks that you seem to keep coming up with in your plan. And it seems to me that the where the plan usually informs the elevation, in this case, the eleva elevation is informing the plan so that the window fits. The same thing occurs in unit uh, 416. I'm looking at the plans where you have these funny little kinks. And I think that was brought up at the last presentation. And uh, these things kind of indicate to me there's a certain lack of what, uh, I don't know, competence, if you like, in, the, in planning. Uh, uh, and so there's one other, there's a few other issues that I have in mind, but I'm finding it awkward not being able to be in the full-blown spirit of the, of the meeting. Uh, can I bring up a couple more, uh, Mr. Chair? So, uh, sure, uh, we are still just finishing off the question period. Um, also, uh, are there any uh, that you would be phrasing to the proponents as questions, or should or is the group ready to move okay. on to comments? Okay, well, okay, I have one question then. Sure. Um, if you look at the, um, for instance, the balcony arrangements, which seem to be exaggerated in one area and, and not in others, and I'm wondering, for instance, the studio, again, 407 studio, uh, unit A, and then the one bedroom units on either side, the balconies are much smaller uh, for the one bedroom unit than the studio, quite a bit smaller, in fact. And it seems to me that if you wrap the balcony around the, the, the face of uh, the one bedroom unit, you would get something at more equitable size. But anyway, that's the kind of thing that I see that really jumps out of it at me and I wonder why, uh, was it for the sake of form or why these things take this shape? That's all for now. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> so I would like to uh, make a suggestion here to the panel. Um, there are um, a lot of layers of complexity to this proposal. And what I would ask is we we'll try something a little bit different today, and that's to comment on the proposal generally uh, from an urban design perspective, um, looking at um, uh, things like parking, number of units, interface uh, with the ground plane, those types of things. Um, because I, I, I do worry that, um, oh, I, I, it might be, it might not materialize, but I do worry that there's so much potential detail to talk about here that I don't want to get, uh, I don't want the panel to necessarily get caught up in uh, the minutia if there are bigger issues that the panel wants to discuss. Um, so if you're all in agreement with that approach, um, I'd like to start off with comments. And um, Paul, those were, those were borderline comments, but do you have any other, um, let's call them bigger picture, uh, observations, concerns, issues, or praise um, for, the, for the proposal as it's been redesigned for us? And if Paul, if you're still formulating your thoughts, um, I'll move to Phil. Phil's got his hand up and he seems excited to, to participate. So Phil, um, comments on overall? You're asking me that? Okay. Yes. Yes, I'm it's Paul. Yeah, no, I, uh, oh. I think there, there are so many things in this, in this project that need to be worked on to my satisfaction anyway, including 
very broad issues such as storage, that kind of thing. And I have been looking at the plans uh, uh, on a regular basis and trying to find solutions to things that I see that are a problem. And uh, in my view anyway, and, and certainly there are broad aspects which I think are really short and could be straightened out fairly easily. But um, one of them including storage where there's a tremendous lack of storage. I think the guidelines call for 25 square feet per unit, but anyway, if you had a storage unit, for instance, opposite the elevator, if you took out three units there, including the double height lobby space, you could put in a storage compartment or storage lockers in those spaces, which would be much more convenient and usable. Whereas it is the, the going down in the basement, people won't use them, or if they do, they'll end up storing on their balconies. So there are lots of things that look to me as though they've been missed here. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, so I'll move through my list again here with comments on the overall. Um, Bill, go ahead, if you're ready. They're struggling to hear you. Yeah, I'm not. Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, first of all, I, uh, I I know we were thrown a little bit for a loop at the beginning about the four the the two designs, but I'm really glad that we saw the two. Uh, you know, this the the other alternative. Uh, but let me speak to the um, to the initial the the. Formal proposal, I guess, is what I thought of design. Uh, yes, there's some improvement. Certainly, there's been more information and detail. Um, when I I stepped back from, and, and let me be clear, and correct me if I'm wrong, that on the south side, uh, it's essentially six story, plus a little bit of roof and a bigger um, and from the street level. It's six plus a little bit. Is that correct? Just to be, I want to be clear. And on the north side, it's five stories, plus a stairway or something. But it's, it's six and five. I want to be absolutely sure. Clear. I'm sure. sure. Lucas or Eric from, from Keystone? Can, can uh, is, sorry, you cut out there for a second. Just quickly reframe that question or rephrase it. So, so Phil was trying to un, uh, get clarity on the number of stories on the north side versus the south side. And I think that this is actually a good um, partial segue into other things. Um, I think that the architects around the table know that um, BC Building Code counts stories in a different way than, than often zoning bylaws count stories. Um, and I think that just generally moving forward with your proposal, particularly if we're dealing with such a touchy subject, is to be crystal clear with which um, bylaw or building code you're going to be referencing so that it's defensible from your own perspective, right? Like just talking as peers, I think it's important to be able to say by white rock zoning standards definitions, for example, or if you choose to use BC building code for whatever reason that you, you select that. So um, perhaps uh, to help clarify for Phil, Greg, can you, I'm, I'm not as versed with the White Rock zoning bylaw as I know that you are. Can you please let me know if, if you have it on hand, um, what the definition is for a story in White Rock or Keystone, if you want to, um, to help us out. Through you, Mr. Chair, I can start and then uh, Key, Keystone can elaborate. Um, there's two, two pieces to height. So one is how height is measured. So height is measured on the basis of an average natural grade. And so I think there's been an acknowledgement around the table that there is a, a slope to this property moving north to south down the hill. Um, so what we would typically do is a, a BC land surveyor would um, measure average natural grade on the basis of where the building is to be positioned on the lot. You take the midpoint of each wall and the average of those points defines the average natural grade and then you measure to the highest part of the building um, from that point and that defines building height. So most of our zone, zones don't prescribe a maximum height in stories, they prescribe a maximum height in meters measured between the average natural grade and the top of the building. In this case, as I mentioned, the proposal is to create a property specific CB zone 
through which we would establish a height that is reflective of the height of the design of the building. So it, it's not drawing from a, a stock height within one of our zones. Yeah. I guess some of, some of the confusion is uh, really when when you're speaking to lay people about heights of buildings, uh, people don't normally consider it in meters or feet. Yeah. They wonder how, how many stories is that building? And I guess really, can we cut to that here? Um, in White Rock, is there, regardless of the physical height, is there a definition of stories? Yes, there is. Uh, I'm just going to, I'll just share with the with the group here so it's easier. I will say that, the, oops, I will so say hope, that. Hopefully you can see that yeah. through you, Mr. Chair, uh, the panel can see that. So, right. so, so that means that for the P1 level, we're looking at seeing whether or not that counts as a basement uh, in italics, assume that's a defined term as well, right? And then that from there, we would count as many stories that, as we see. Yeah, that, that's right, Mr. Chair, yeah. Okay, so knowing that, then Keystone, are you able to address Bill's question then, or, or at least tell us which, which is your point of reference? Is it the White Rock Zoning Bylaw or is it the BC Building Code? Um, well, the six story is definitely the BC Building Code reference. Uh, okay. The five story and four story reference that we've been throwing around, that would be more related to the, the White Rock Zoning Bylaw. So at the north end of the building, um, because the first floor is somewhat sunk in there, we're actually more like a four and a half story building. And then as you work your way south towards the main entry of the building, um, the, the gray drops off obviously, and that, that story becomes fully exposed to five stories. And then right at the entry, we actually drop the entire building down a full story. So as you work your way south from the main entry, it sort of becomes a four story again, and then gray drops off further and becomes five story again towards the south. Thank you, Lucas. Does that answer your question, Bill? No, no actually, you, you've got because you're, you're more technical than I was ever going to be. Um, oh, okay. I think that's important uh, to clarify for perhaps everybody, but that wasn't where I was going with this. <laughs> the, the issue for me is looking at the building, and I've been around the site several times to try to get a feel. And I want to, these are about comments now, not quite that, although that was a question, I want to make sure I, I didn't make a comment that wasn't based on fact. So one of the, the key, we were at our last October meeting dealing with a lot of details. Uh, because there was a lack of certain information and we were looking at interiors and structures and, and I was talking about trees and so on. But what we only a few of our comments were about massing and, you know, about the feel of the of the building for in the context of the neighborhood. And that's really what I want to talk about now as my comment, because we are, are one of our charges, our mandates is to the, the, the how does the development fits within the neighborhood context, urban design, site design, compatibility of built form, the potential for land use impacts such as shadowing, parking and so on. So it's really the bigger context of which from the street. Um, and it's not even about views from, let's say Beverly, but it's really about the feel from the street. And the concern that I have is that it's and that's why i want to be clear when i looked at the at the draw at the renderings i'm clearly seeing from standing on on thrift looking toward the design i'm seeing six floors and a little bit more because of anyway let's say six stories clearly to me when I look from on the Vidal going up the street to the north, and I look at the north end, I clearly see, I see five floors of residences. I'm not gonna quibble about a foot here or there about a, a, a pop-up or a, a little bit there. So that's the context in which I'm making these comments about the six walking up, then you see five. And and I'm looking at the at the neighborhood across the street is a basically from street level a two story around the corner of paddy corner across is a two or three. But basically everything in the area is two is two, three or four stories. 
And some are older, some are not uh, newer as you walk, go down a little bit toward uh, down thrift. So I'm looking at it and then I look at this at the design. And I ask myself, does this fit the neighborhood in the context that it's there? And the, my answer is that, and we raised this in our comment where it said, building may need to be broken down into three separate buildings. And that came up in part because of people saying that's a massive, massive front along Vidal. And, uh, and while they've lowered and changed some of the facing, and I appreciate that, it doesn't change the fundamentals of the large size of that building. And I liken it, and I'm not sure if this is a, a fair one, but in my view, it's like taking a, a big ship or a boat and putting it down among a lot of medium-sized to uh, uh, boats if, if instead of land, it's water, it was water. So I just think that it's too big. That's really for the, in the context of the neighborhood, which is what we've been asked how the development fits within the neighborhood context. Now, with that said, and that's my, the only comment that I'm gonna make uh, here um, about that design, I was very pleased to see the revised design, the one floor lower. I mean, it may have issues, it may have issues too. I would prefer to see some, some more broken down as, we, as the ADP has seen in some other, bit, other designs, but it's clearly to me a much more um, it fits because you can't you know there's the there's the the, the 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 streetscape of this this big building and the height and if you at least reduce the height it helps. I prefer to see something more broken up, but it's much better. So that, that's my basic comment, and and I'll end with this. I am not. I would not accept. Um, the, 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 the applicant, uh, uh, I mean, we're going to have to come to a vote at some point or a resolution. And I would simply say, recommend, I'm not moving this now, I'd recommend um, uh, rejection of what's been presented to us. But that doesn't mean I would... The, the, okay, Bill. Well, uh, I've lost you again there. Are you there? Did you hear me? Did you hear I can my hear last? you. I can hear you, but you're you're frozen in time. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Could you hear my comment? It's not a motion. Yeah. But it, yep. I'm no, right. absolutely. And and I do thank you for your comments. That that is this is the time and place for that. Yeah. yeah we we don't want to be uh, preemptive yet. Um, I think it's important to hear from the entire panel. So absolutely. I'm going to move to uh, Rushir, um as uh, our landscape architect and also architect. Um, for overall comments, Rushir, on on the, the very things that Bill was talking about, neighborhood context, urban design, interface, et cetera. Sure. I'm, I'm going to try and be as objective as possible based on the past comments of the presentation and what was asked uh, of the applicants to be done. They've done a good job in, time, in terms of getting uh, the details out. They've also resolved some of the issues, some of the elevations, especially on the on the on the east side seems to be better resolved with those pop-ups gone and clear demarcation between some of the breaking down of volumes but i kind of agree with uh, with uh, with the uh, uh, fail there that yeah uh, it's still a large mass but uh, i guess more or less what talking in general sense some more design development is needed i'll talk first off the site management and circulation um, there seems to be lack of clarity about what's going to be happening on the north and west edge. There are a lot of green spaces next to the trees being retained. Um, what kind of access is going to be permitted? What kind of space quality of that area is going to be? Um, there's been talk of, uh, of eyes on the street and security and all that, but I guess a little more uh, resolution and clarity about what's going to be happening object in space, the building sitting there and how it's being treated, how pedestrian movements, et cetera, is happening. I would have liked to see some sort of 
transparency or broken down of building um, because it's such a linear building to have access from east to west and to be able to go to the western setback and those those areas and some some other uh, open spaces but i guess uh, uh that's not uh, applicant has said that that was not possible so we accept that there is uh, some more resolution probably required uh, in terms of uh, elements of design both uh, in architectural and landscape for example the planters that we talked about on the rooftop uh, housing big trees i know they are doable they've been done in the past but uh, for a, for a building which is at least half or half rental not a best solution i would have said uh, maybe use because it was kind of conflicting one of the presentation said that uh, the planters are going to be on pedestals and then uh, the landscape architect endorsed that they are going to be built in planters so some sort of clarity needs to be there as to what's going to be happening whether there are pedestal movable planters because they are more likely to survive in a rental environment uh, whereas built in planters are rather tough to be handled and also especially with 10 cubic meters of soil volume etc being done similarly uh, there's a whole lot of uh, programming in landscape for example the rooftop but storage water bibs etc are uh, i don't know whether they've been thought out or not integrated with the building itself um, now i'll give you a very small example of the planting on the periphery there's a skinnia Japonica, which is predominantly on the edge of uh, the periphery, which is a shade to part, sh part shade to full shade kind of a plant. And there's an opportunity of having more uh, tree loving shrubs, which have require less maintenance, especially in a rental condition being used there. Uh, that's just an example. Similarly, I feel that despite a good resolution of architecture on the western side, uh, there is still a lot of resolution required on the southern side with those uh, large terraces cascading, which are a good idea because they do allow for southern uh, capturing of sun as well as the view. But I guess they seem to be, if you see the perspectives from the south side, especially the south west side, they seem to be slightly unresolved. Even the windows behind them seem to be slightly unresolved. Their angles seem to clash against each other. So this needs to be some more dedicated thought to treat that uh, cascading in itself. Similarly, uh, we, uh, Paul uh, quickly talked about the unit layouts. I, if you just, I'll give you a small example. Majority of the units on the west side are unit B, which uh, do have a bedroom and a closet. Closet opens into the window and there is and then there is a balcony so if you see uh, the bedroom itself is about 25 feet from a natural light so that uh, unit i don't think is going that bedroom i don't think is going to be getting any natural light and there are quite a few on the western side so uh, um, and there are small little kinks which uh, seem which were paul pointed out about uh, um, about part about attempts to position the elevational windows, etc. So I guess a lot of uh, uh, resolution of plan, plan uh, uh, units in the plan will also be needed in terms of refining the design further. It's gone a long way since the last time, but I agree that a lot of resolution is still to be required. I think uh, those are my broader perspective comments. OK, uh, thank you, Rashir, for that. Um, and I'll move to Faye, please. Mr. Chair, so, sorry, just interrupting, Greg. Go ahead. Sorry to, sorry to interrupt, and um, thank you to, to Phil and Rashir for the comments. If, if I may, Mr. Chair, um, I'm, I'm just a little mindful to the level of specificity in some of the comments, and certainly defer to the the panel on these things. I'm taking meeting minutes as we go, so I'm, I'm, and, I'm and just for all those participating, we are recording the meeting, and we mentioned that off the bat, but some people join late. Um, I, I just think it's really important that we keep in mind that the mandate of the panel is to focus on the design, the form and character of the of the design as it relates to the city's development permit guidelines. So I'm, I, I, I'll defer to your best judgment on this. I don't mean to overstep in any way, uh, and I hope I'm not. But um, 
We look to your advice as professionals as it relates to the project's conformity with the, or alignment with these guidelines and not to get too into the details of designing the interior spaces on behalf of, of the applicants. I just think we may be getting a little too far down. Respectfully, I, I really don't mean any offense to that comment. Um, but I'm just and, trying to be mindful of where we go from here. So no, no for sure. And 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 I'm taken, Greg. Um, I, I think that a lot of the comments that we're hearing are simply uh, in part reaction to where we've come uh, from with this project. Uh, you, you can't kind of open the door early on and then and then expect it to be wholly closed at the next meeting. Um, but that's what one of the reasons why I thought it would be. Uh, prudent to start with overall comments first um, to see how we do fit in with with the um, the development permit guidelines uh, and and really talking about stepping back to our mandate which is context um, so ground plane context massing number of units um, and then depending on how the rest of our discussion goes um, if necessary revisiting some of the things that although as you say are teetering on the edge of our mandate, um, we're still within and 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 uh, responded to um, on a, in the ADP comment response letter. So in a way, it's been it's been pushed onto the table. Uh, but I will try to uh, steer the first portion, that the overall comments. If if the next um, panel members, being Faye and Sharon, um, if you can kind of stick to big picture stuff for now, and then we'll have a little bit of a discussion and then see where we go from here. Does that sound fair? Okay, so I'll, I'll turn it over to Faye. Um, any particular uh, observations or comments that you wanna to bring to the proponents at this time? Just a couple. Um, and uh, my first comment is I do like the design, uh, the one that's proposed with five level. I think it uh, blends in nicely with the area. Um, and there's a lot of development in that area as well with the, the newer, um, with the newer, uh, condos that have been recently built. So just being mindful of that, I think it does blend in quite well and complements that area. Um, the only thing that kind of right now, other than I, I just want to be mindful not to repeat some of the comments that have already been made, uh, I didn't see a lot of residential amenities that kind of stuck out for me there. Um, in this day and age, things like, um, you know, the um, a common garden area where people can plant, do their own uh, garden. And that's a really big thing in Vancouver. And it's, it's the same here in the White Rock area, community garden. Um, and I didn't see a lot of storage units, and that's one thing that Paul had mentioned. I thought there was a shortage of uh, storage units, and um, and I'm not going to make any comments on the design in terms of you know the size of the units, etc. I think that that's a separate thing. But but thank you. Okay, thank you, Faith. Um, and Sharon, uh, if you don't mind, you're up for comments. Okay. Um, just touching on a few of the comments that were already made, I think um, in this is a transformative neighborhood that has changed a lot. And we also, to the north of this building, have a 12-story building. Um, yes, there are a mix, and that's what makes uh, neighborhoods interesting, is you have a mix of sizes and shapes. If everything was the same, it, it doesn't have the same dynamics. And we, in general, all over Canada are having a housing crisis and it's called supply. And if we start cutting back developments that fit within the rules and the guidelines that are allowed because we think it's too tall and five stories doesn't to me make a tall building, then we are cutting back housing and we are in desperate need for more. And this is a, um, in an area that is on transit. It ticks all those boxes. It's walkable. It's um, it's being respectful of the neighborhood. There's There's been a lot of work done and yeah, there's going to be more to do. And again, with the interiors, that's based on their market research and they're the experts. Um, we ha can have opinions about it, but I think that they've done a, um, they've done a good job in the aesthetically allowing it to fit into the neighborhood as best they can. They have many challenges and um, um, 
it's not ever going to tick all the boxes, but we desperately need more housing here, and this is not a concrete high rise. So that's my comment. Thank you, Sharon. Um, so I haven't missed any panel members. I think everyone has their main comment in. Um, now, I guess, is mine. Um, there are certainly aspects of what's been put in front of us uh, from an urban des design perspective that I like. Um, uh, as Sharon's identified, this is a transitional area. We do have a tall building behind us and we do have smaller buildings around us. Um, and I think that ultimately there has to be a response that isn't going to make everybody happy, um, but does the best it can in terms of uh, making sure that most people are happy. Um, now, has this design solved it? Switching and putting on my architect's hat, I don't, I don't know if it has. I 100% believe that the proponents have upped their game quite a bit from what we last saw. But I do agree with panel members um, that there is still a lot of development to occur. And I know, based on what we're seeing now and based on the discussion we had at the beginning, that this certainly isn't you know, getting geared up to go to building permit or anything like that. It's still, in my view, somewhere between schematic design and design development. Um, I think that a lot of the resolution uh, for things like windows, which are driven by uh, bedroom placement and all of those things will come and eventually be um, uh, resolved by the architect team. I have full confidence that they'll be able to do that. Um, I think that that was really a, a lot of the, the source for a lot of the comments um, was just, there's just some dissonance when even at the schematic level, some things just don't seem believable. Um, but from an overall perspective, I think that the access to the development um, has been solved in a satisfactory way. I do appreciate the cross sections uh, given to us by the landscape architect to really understand what the interface is on thrift, what what the what the interface is on the east as well. I think that's a very important piece. Um, are there problems? Yeah, I think that there's problems with the interface, but again, there are things that I think that the development team can work through. Um, moving to a, a, just a, an observational comment as an example, uh, dealing with the ground plane, obviously we all know that larger buildings, whether they're lying on their side or they're standing up tall, um, really rely on human beings uh, perception of the building at ground level. Um, I think that while it certainly is um, honorable to try to bring in a townhouse feel to the lower units on I think it's level two or level one sort, I think that that's going to be a bit difficult uh, given that's the back door um, to, to uh, most of those suites. I believe that most of the entry is through a common corridor or the main entries. So those are the types of things that I would think that the, the, the design team would want to grapple with to make sure that what they ultimately uh, end up pursuing when they add more detail to it is really believable all around. Um, and then I would also say that uh, just looking at other comments here. No, I'll save it um, for now. They're, they're more of the minutia. And what I would like to, to do is just circle back to the group. And now that we've had a chance uh, to hear one another, um, if anyone wants to add any additional, additional comments or feel that it is appropriate to start to really dial in, whether it's, I'm not saying necessarily the inside, but onto the architectural detail on the outside, because that does fall under our purview. Um, so, Phil, I see your hand up. Uh, was there a particular comment that you wanted to add? And then I should say before you before you get going that we don't want to leave the design team and the development proponents um, out in the cold here. They will have an opportunity to respond to our comments um, uh, towards the end. Uh, Phil, go ahead. No, if they want to respond, and then I'll. I'll okay. So, so maybe let, let's do that first, um, and then we can see whether or not we want to um, use the rest of our time to, to look at more details. So I would ask uh, Peter, uh, uh, Eric, and Lucas, and David, are there any um, responses, consolidated or otherwise, to some of the comments? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, the, the one thing I will say on behalf of Weststone Every single development that's ever done has detailed design work that needs to be done after advisory design panels and working with the staff at the city to ensure that uh, we meet all of the requirements that the city has. 
Uh, I will say I've walked the site personally a number of times and there is no question. Uh, if you build a building on that site with the slope, you have to try and integrate it. It will be a larger building, but I believe the architectural group has tried to break up that visual impact as much as you can. The other thing is it's important for a developer to be able to develop a unit that is financially viable. Um, and that is always an issue. You have to find the balance between the number of suites, the size, what the market is uh, starting to dictate in terms of the number of units. And I think issues like the rooftop uh, planting and access around the site and the integration between the various landscape elements and so on are all details that absolutely the developer is committed to working uh, with the landscape architect, with the uh, architects of the building. And detailed design on the inside in the suites. Again, in this day and age, uh, and, and it was said earlier that millennials uh, want a whole different life experience than seniors who are downsizing. And then seniors who downsize are looking for things when their life changes significantly, but they still would like to grow or live in space. So all of these things are, are issues that the developer has thought about uh, and looked at, respecting the neighbors to the north and to the west and their quality of life by building a building that, that does fit in, protecting the environment and the major trees have all been talked about. So I would just simply say on, on behalf of Westone, absolutely, if this project does move forward, it will be worked on and the detail will be worked through um, so that the end product again is something that the city can be proud of. And I don't know whether Lucas or Eric have anything else they wanna add on some of those other comments. Yeah, no, I was, that was well said, Peter. I just did want to point out that um, Peter touched on this already. Westone's done quite a bit of market analysis and research on, on these unit layouts and the unit sizes, and it, it's something that um, they feel is viable and, and, and the layouts have been vetted uh, through through the marketing process. So, I mean, uh, there, there's always room for improvement, and we, we're going to definitely take some of the comments that we're hearing here and, and see if there's improvements that we can make. Um, and it includes the balcony sizes as well. I think we, we tried to address balcony size comment from, from the, the previous meeting when we heard it, and we, we, we kind of rearranged them and, and kind of made the balcony sizes fit better with the size of the unit that's adjacent to them. So we have addressed that, but I see that there's probably still some, some room for improvement there on the balcony size items as well. And the only comment I would make is just, uh, just a, a comment on, on uh, sort of perception of size and scale of a building. So, and we've done uh, we just we, we've done a lot of multifamily over the years and lots of times there's challenges to try to make the building look smaller or shorter and uh, this site has really given us an opportunity to step it back and uh, of course i walk around a lot of the buildings that we do after after they're built to get a feel of if, you know because a drawing can only tell you so much but what i can say is on this site i, I really do think that uh, with this cascading deck and whatnot as a pedestrian walking around the site, it won't, I don't believe it's going to be seen as a, as a tall building. Any, any other, any other thoughts from the proponent team on comments uh, given by the panel? The only item I would add from the landscape side is just to clarify that on the north and north and west side, there is access to those, those plantings there and we there will be maintainable access. So they're, they're not going to be just open plants like we, we can we'll work. And then like everybody has been mentioning a few things on the landscape side, it's really detailed design where we're going to get into maintenance access, service access, gates, fences, all those different things. We just haven't gotten to that level of design yet. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I I think just uh, responding to some of those responses to comments, particularly directed to the architects, um, I, you, you know, there, there's what development wants to achieve, you know, the economics of development that we're all cognizant of. Um, there are um, kind of minimum requirements. Um, if you look at BC Housing, as Paul was talking about, for example, I think that the real challenge um, for architects is to find a balance uh, between the needs and and the 
the, the push of their client and doing what's right, right? Which I think that our training in particular is looking at the human experience in those suites. I know, I think that we all collectively know there's a balance there um, that we would expect you to continue to, to develop and, and really make sure that the human being in these buildings is actually having a good experience, has enough places to put all of their skis and other things, is able to age in place. So perhaps having adaptable suites that aren't just for three veterans, because as Peter himself said, what if uh, an older partner dies, the, the, the remaining partner would go to a smaller suite, but none of those suites are adaptable. Right. So thinking about the human side and how these spaces will actually evolve, I think that uh, you've got a tall task ahead of you for that. Um, it's it's not going to be a, it, it's it's not going to be easy because there are so many challenging aspects to it. So many stakeholders um, from the panel. Are there any other comments um, that anyone wants to voice or in fact from the proponents, if you want to continue to respond? I can. Uh, I do have a small comment if I could. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Um, all the comments that I I I I, th I thought it's my responsibility to kind of say because my comments uh, got the response from Greg that yeah we are getting into details but uh, all uh, I I would like to make it clear that I really like the efforts that the proponents have gone this time providing us the detail, developing the design, which seems to be much better done than the last time. All the comments that I did, both uh, from building perspective uh, and the landscape, the scheme, movement, circulation, they are all aimed at developing the design further. And I, and I know with the way they have progressed since the last submission, they are very capable of developing it to that level. It's not a it's not a criticism or to say that the uh, the design is not worthy of developing further, but I think they were constructive comments in saying that yeah, uh, there is some resolution to be done in my opinion at least uh, to the south side of architecture where uh, the cascading is a great idea, but it needs to be arch articulated further. Similarly, movement circulation they are not. Uh, I think incidental, they are a part of design, especially uh, at the design development stage as to where the people are going, what surfaces they are, where they're headed, what kind of controls of uh, the residents are going to be, where the mixing of uh, resident versus the external uh, population is going to be, where their interaction is going to be, how those uh, uh, small little uh, components of design that have been designed that have been proposed. How are they going to work or not work? I think those are important parts and that need to be addressed and I'm sure they'll be addressed effectively going forward. But uh, but yes, uh, I still think there are quite a few things that need to be continued to work be worked upon and and this is not a negative comment. This should be taken constructively. Thank you. Uh, absolutely, Rishir, and thank you. Uh, I did not view it as negative, your initial comments, um, and, and I do appreciate them uh, when they were made. I see a number of hands up, so I'm going to go in the order that they came up. Uh, the first I see is, is, I believe it's Paul. It's just a P. So is that Paul? Yes. Um, I didn't have my hand up because you can't oh. see it. But oh, it's, someone's it's, got a hand there beside us. I, I would P. like, <clears throat> yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Yeah, yeah, I would like to. I would like to. Uh, uh, re I suppose repeat what Phil had to say. I think he articulated it extremely well. There's a certain, I believe, a certain uh, sense of what is appropriate in that particular setting, and I do agree that for some reason it is like a a great ship pulled up beside the dock and really doesn't relate to all the other little boats around it. So, uh, uh, but the design has improved incredibly from the original presentation and I appreciate the work that they've gone into, but that I think that still needs to be um, beat up a little more, I'm sorry to say, but that's, um, uh, that's all I can, can add at this point, but I look forward to seeing some refinement 
in in the design, not only in the detail, but the detail sort of talks to the whole development eventually. Like they say, God is in the details, and I expect that they'll sort themselves out to the benefit of everyone involved. Thank you. Appreciate that, Paul. Thank you. Um, and then I see Sharon had her hand up next, and then we'll get to Peter. Um, just a, a general concern kind of um, layered onto what I was speaking of. If we start making these build this building smaller and getting less units, it is do it is not addressing affordability, which was one of the things discussed at the beginning. Um, if we have less supply, we have less affordability. So, looking at the number of units, um, it is critical that we continue to work towards that. And if it's within the guidelines that the city has laid out for densification, we have to be mindful that we can't keep making smaller buildings with less units. They will still they will continue to be more expensive, and affordability is a huge issue. So I just want to put that comment out there to be mindful of the fact that there is ways of densifying gently without um, affecting the affordability of supply. Yeah, and thank you, Sharon. Um, Peter, you had a, you wanted to add a comment? Yeah, just a final comment, Mr. Chair. Uh, I do wanna say to every member of the panel that your comments are respectfully received and will be considered uh, moving forward. Um, and, you know, I think it's like everything. Um, as someone said, the detail is where you really get into it. And that's the job that the developer, the architects and the landscape architect have to do working with staff in the city to make sure that the balance is found for all of the issues that need to be considered. Uh, and I will say this, having been around uh, a number of tables myself, the reality is change always affects people differently. And some people are in favor of it and other people are not. Um, and that's one of the challenges developers have to work with. But what's important is that the end product meets not only the current needs, but what the perspective needs are for the future. And that's where the analysis of the type of housing, the quality of housing, the balance of housing and all of those things come in. So I just really want to thank the panel on behalf of Weststone for all the comments and indeed all of them will be considered. Thank you, Peter. Um, and, and I appreciate your comments. Um, I think that collectively we're all trying to make sure that the community is done well by and that um, and that everyone uh, benefits from this development, whether it just be seeing it in the neighborhood or actually living there. Um, but that brings to to the panel our challenge. Go ahead, Phil. Yeah, Sorry, I've not. I've got a bunch of hands again. So I see Phil first. Thank you. Uh, can you yeah. hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Hey. Yeah, I want to. Uh, I want to keep moving this along, and, and it's really a question to, I guess, Greg and, and to some extent Joe, but before uh, about, you know, what do we do with all of these comments? And, uh, but before I get to that, I want to uh, respond to some things that were already stated about the purpose of the panel. Um, I'm caught in, be when I say in between, that I'm not an architect, so I don't get involved in some of those details, but I certainly am a resident and I I'm very um, interested in our, our primary mandate, our sole mandate is about design panel and the context. I go back to our form and character of impacts, alignment with applicable uh, the guidelines. How does it fit within the neighborhood? I, sorry, but issues about affordability and about finances and others are not a design issue. Uh, per se, it's certainly ours are recommendations to council about design, and um, with that, I see. Um, I want to go to where we're going with this. I see a, somewhat of a split the panel between the proposal and the lower, sort of the the formal one before us and the lower one. 
Um, yeah, and and I'm I'm going to interject for a second, Jill, because that's exactly where I was going. I want to, I need um, to about yeah. how we deal with that. I will just simply put it on the on the on the table that I cannot support the formal one, but I could entertain the yeah. lower one coming back. Sure, sure, and and unfortunately that is not on our table today. Um, but just in response to you, just speaking as an architect. Um, Design is not just about what the building looks like and that interface. Uh, design for an architect, um, and I think someone someone else said it here, comes from the inside out sometimes, and sometimes it comes from the outside in. So, you know, the relative complexity of it is given by the individual proposal. Um, but that said, what I, where I was going with this was, um, we do have a challenge ahead of us. And I and I I'll open the dialogue with Greg because we're in a bit of a, a position here. Not only I'm I'm detecting as well a bit of a a little bit of a, a, a split within the panel, but just in terms of regardless of which direction it goes, um, what are what are we really um, motioning here? Like uh, you know, if there are further discussions to amend or change the OCP. Uh, or, or, or there are other factors that might uh, change the density and therefore the scale of this project. Uh, what, what are we trying? It, it, it's kind of more. It's not even a philosophical question. It's just uh, I'm just a bit lost here in terms of how we can be the most productive, uh, not only for our panel and therefore providing our advice to mayor and council, um, but to the proponents here if they are. Uh, you know, if they receive additional instruction from us. So maybe a little, throw me a lifeline here, Greg, and, and perhaps some expectations from the planning side. Sure, and thank you, Mr. Chair. And I appreciate the feedback from, from Rashir to clarify your intentions and uh, only had only interjected at you because uh, I couldn't get in in front of Phil in time. So um, where we go from here at this point really is, it, it's up to the panel. It's, I think it's to an extent your level of comfort with ability of city staff to work through some of these issues and the architect uh, and and the um, the proponents team to respond to the feedback that you've offered in a in a in a meaningful way I think some of the comments were shared about circulation around the building and maintenance of these planner boxes if you can't get there to maintain them they're just going to become whittled away messes on the side of the building and we want to avoid that as a city it causes hardship to neighboring landowners and residents so we want to make sure that doesn't happen so the comments are really important um, uh, as I say, I think, Mr. Chair, it depends on your level of comfort with our ability to advance this to the next stage. The next stage would be if, for example, the committee were to support it moving forward through the process, not subject to addressing the issues that have been, in, have been discussed today, that I move forward, uh, we would prepare a bylaw, as I mentioned, in a report to the Land Use and Planning Committee to, to give the bylaw potential first and second reading, and then to refer the matter to a, a statutory public hearing. There are a lot of members of the public here with us tonight that I'm sure have an interest in offering their opinion direct to council on how this project moves forward. So um, that would be one, one path we could take is if there's a, a recommendation of support. If there's not a recommendation of support from the panel, for example, it's a recommendation that it the terms of reference for the panel has these three options. It's recommends um, that it proceed, recommend that it not proceed, or recommend that it proceed subject to certain things being addressed. Um, so, so those are some options available to the panel and certainly take direction, um, or at least the feedback from the panel moving the project forward. Fair, fair enough, and, and thank you for that. So what I will do um, is open the floor uh, to the panel members, um, if anyone wants to make a motion, I think that um, in order for us to even move forward in this meeting, there has to be a motion uh, that we can discuss and debate if necessary and eventually vote on. Um, so, you know, if the panel wants to take a moment and if there are any volunteers uh, to put forward a motion of this panel, um, and then we can, we can have the discussion as needed. Can I propose no, a motion? Joe. Sorry. Sorry, Joe. It's Sorry. May. Yes. Someone I has can. been having their hand up quite some time. Gary. 
Oh, right. I don't see it on my screen. Yeah, he's had his hand up about four or five times, and and he, his questions haven't been addressed. So, sorry, I, sorry. Who is who is Gary? Gary, there? I'm not sure. Can you see that? Oh, what? Gary, Gary Quinn. Yes. Yeah. Um. I I don't know. I I believe is he a member of the public? Um. Greg. Yes, he is. I don't see his hand, and I'm as the organizer of the meeting. I'm typically I unable to see all the hands, but. If um, if any member of the public has comments or questions, uh, please direct them to me via email, um, gnewman at whiterockcity.ca, and I'm happy to try to uh, work with you through any comments or questions, but the, okay. the members of the public are invited to the meetings to observe only. Okay. Thanks, Dave. I think that there was an errant hand that appeared to be on his, um, his screen there, but uh, Rashir, you were you were going to propose a motion to this uh, for the panel. Yeah, I was going to propose a motion that the project be conditionally accepted uh, and uh, with the conditions uh, being brought forward um, to be addressed because they've shown good track record in progressing. They still have a. Uh, uh, Quite a distance to go, I think, but uh, but they've shown a good uh, example and track record of being able to advance and resolve the issues. That would okay. be my proposal. proposal. So, if, if everyone is clear on on the content of that motion, do I have a second seconder for that motion to allow us to discuss? So I'll second it. They have seconded. So yes. now discussion on that motion. Um, any of the panel members still? Physical hand up this time. That's a good question for it's sort of a drag. Um, the we're caught in part. It has to do with the land use in the area about with the OCP and the bylaws and so on. I know they can go forward with a comprehensive development regardless and ask for a for a uh, a, uh, a rezoning. My the question is, can this be deferred? This is our our. Uh, Third, op there's four options. The third one is to defer pending resolution of issues. Well, one of the big issues is for Pat is for the council um, about about that area. Uh, and is that something that makes sense in this? I mean, look, the, the applicant came back and said, "Look, we've got this. I'll call it this the 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 formal proposal and an alternative. Is this something that that should come back?" to us after council has decided about the OCP and the the land use in the area, which is going to happen at the end of end of well, I guess early July. Yeah, yeah. So through you, Mr. Chair, um, short answer is no. I think that um, the option to defer the application as outlined in the terms of reference would be to defer it pending um, response to the comments received today. And to bring it back to similar to what we've done here in round two to bring back for subsequent review it shouldn't be to defer it on the basis of ongoing um, other sort of projects or or um, policy related work undertaken by the city i think we have to review this on the basis of the policy framework that exists today uh, in addition to the the applicable zoning standards and on that basis make recommendations to council but to answer your 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 comment phil i think that there is work that's happening. And if, for example, before we're able to get a report in front of the Land Use and Planning Committee to give the project first and second reading at rezoning, potentially if you know if we're able to get there, um, if the underlying policy framework changes, there may be a need for new amendments, new applications, in which case we may be back to bringing a, a different project back to the panel. So I would suggest through the chair that the panel look at the project on its on the basis of the merits and the policy framework that exists today. And on that basis, make a decision on how you want to move it. Agreed. Uh, we don't have crystal balls, so all we have is what's in front of us. Um, Paul, you had your hand up. You're muted, Paul. You're muted. Oh, I'm sorry. So I had my mic turned off. I just got back online again. I don't know why it was up. Anyway, uh, uh, what Phil had to say earlier really struck a chord with me. And from coming from an engineering background, I think he had the architectural aspect pretty well nailed. But um, what do you do with a project like this? Is it going to just keep coming back and back and back? Because they just don't seem to get it. 
I don't know quite what it is, but I, for one, would, as an architect, would, would like to sit down with a with a felt marker and just circle all the things I see a problem with, straighten them out, and then get back again. But as it is, we're kind of our hands are tied. Uh, and I come in if Paul's finished. Can you? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I'm finished. Yeah, I'm finished. Sure, go ahead. Uh, we're going to have to take a vote, but I will say that I'm going to vote against this um, because the applicant still has the option once things get resolved to come back to us. I, I just cannot see a, that massive uh, building in that location. And uh, the uh, they can come back to us through the process uh, for, a, for a lower one formally for a, a smaller, less massive building uh, at any time. So I don't see in deferring it. Okay, thank you, Bill. So, um, Greg, just in the interest of staying on track, um, did you minute or did you take notes on that on Rushir's motion so that we can actually? I think that there's been. I think it, uh, we're fairly clear on where it is, but I, you know, because it is in motion. Um, would you please uh, have you have you paraphrased it? Here? Yes. So, through you, Mr. Chair, um, the motion that Rushir had presented was that the project be conditionally accepted subject to addressing the comments provided by the panel during the meeting is how I've written okay. it. Yeah. Um, and so, so, yeah. Yeah, no, that's fine, thank you. So I would ask the panel now um, to go to vote on that motion. So I would say all in favor. Um, I guess it's, a, we. I, I don't know if I can see everyone here. I can't see everyone here. So uh, do we have a, um, uh, Joe, Joe, uh, I uh, Joe, I would suggest go person by person uh, sure. on the panel and ask for a agree or disagree. Fair enough. Thank you, Rushir. We'll start with Rushir. Okay, uh, I proposed, so I agree. Okay, um, not necessarily always, but <laughs> and uh, and uh, Sharon. Sorry, you're muted. I'm not allowed to vote. I'm a non-voting oh, member. Of course. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. I would love to though, but I'm yeah, yeah. just here to, you know. Yeah. And uh, Phil, you are also can't hear you. No. Or me, no. Uh, Paul? Well, I'd like to hear the motion again. Is that all right? Of course. Greg, if you would be so kind. Yeah, so the motion is that the project be conditionally accepted subject to addressing the comments provided by the panel during the meeting. I've been taking notes. Uh, you'd have an opportunity to look at the, the meeting minutes as well at the next meeting. Uh, I reluctantly agree to the motion. And then, Faye, are you... Uh, Freshman Army, are you a voting voting member? I believe I'm a voting member. Greg, am I a voting member? Greg? Yes, yes, through you, Mr. Chair. Faye's Sorry. a voting member. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, Faye. <laughs> You're new to I, us. I'm so. a rookie here. Yeah. I um I'm in favor of that okay. motion. All right. So that is three. And if I cast a vote, um, it is also in favor of that motion. Uh, with some reluctance as well, um, and faith in the system as it is, and knowing where we are in the development of this project. And um, I suspect that it won't be the last, regardless of this motion. So the record is one, can two, I, three, and four. Can I make a small question uh, for you, Joe? Of course. So um, in, um, in, in the Surrey Advisory Design Panel, in this selection, which is conditional approval, uh, staff has the power to decide if they want to bring it to the panel again or not. Uh, right. Do we, do, uh, we uh, would Greg like to comment on that? That is that a possibility? Should you need further clarity or input from the panel based on jurisdiction of uh, the staff? Uh, do you want to? Uh, uh, I, I just wanted to put it forward that that is a part of this uh, option in Surrey Design Panel. Surrey, Mr. Chair, um, I'll, I'll double check the terms of reference. I, I think that there is discretion to bring a project to the panel. Um, what I'm thinking of is I know we've looked at other applications in the past and staff have been working with the applicant 
um, some of the applicants for files that we've deferred to come back to the panel and we've we've really kind of drawn a line in the sand to say no this you know you've not addressed this explicit comment so we're not prepared to bring it back yet but I think in this case given that the vote that just passed was to proceed to move it forward subject to addressing the comments and questions I'll just put it out there right now I with the Arctic members and applicant um, in the room our expectation would be that we are finding a resolution to these comments and questions and if we're not of the opinion that they have been addressed, that I think that would be a good suggestion, Rashir, that we may uh, look at bringing it back to the panel to make sure that these comments are satisfactorily addressed. So I think that's a good suggestion. Yeah, absolutely. Because you are kind of going into the realm of, of architecture from planning and in order to bolster uh, any position that Planning Department might have in terms of representing to Mayor and Council, that it would add some strength to that. Uh, I have to ask Phil if he's got a comment. It's a question for Greg sure or question. Greg. Just as with council meetings, uh, could you record the vote as uh, what the vote was and indicate my name as being again? I did through you, Mr. Chair. I voted. I, I had you noted as uh, non non support. So, okay. thank you. All right. Um, <clears throat> so, is there enough? A lot of discussion. I got to go back to my agenda and see where we are now. So that actually concludes um, uh, item 4.1. Uh, so on behalf of the panel, I would like to thank the proponents um, and their presentation. All four of you, thank you uh, for taking your time this evening to come and present the project to us. It was a pleasure to meet some of you and to see some of you again. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have just our own conclusion of the meeting. You're welcome to uh, sit around and, and watch us, or you can go on with your fine evening. The sun's come out, so I think there's better things to do. And um, uh, so thank you again. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your time, and thank you for the very okay. much. Thanks, guys. Now, for the panel, um, all we really have, because we've already talked about our subsequent meetings, so item number five is simply the conclusion of the meeting. So uh, it is 6.15 and I will call the meeting of the advisory design panel on May 18th, officially closed. And I thank you all for participating and uh, your comments, of course. Thank, thank, thank you. you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks, Joe. Good job. Thanks, Paul.